YouTube's Brian Phillips. We've got a box. <laughs> I always love it when they make noises. It's kind of a big box. We'll see what it is. So we haven't mentioned the coupon codes for a while, but on this one in particular, check Brian Phillips RC. If we forget to say it, we have coupon codes that are live there. Oh my goodness, BrianPhillipsRC.com. What is that? It's the Aeros Technum. Okay, so this is 1450 millimeters, the Technum 2010. So this is a general aviation looking plane and it's got floats or gear. We're gonna be doing it with gear. You can order it with or without. So you just have to pick which one you want. Uh, this one is an Aeros branded product. So I assume this has a vector, but I don't know. It has a vector. So we're gonna know that now. Um, okay, so first things first, let's chop this thing open. It's 1,450 millimeters. It is supposed to be a good trainer, 30 amp ESC. Uh, looks like we have a 35, 36, 850 kV motor, nine gram servos. It's got six of them and then it has one nine gram servo that's a 54 degree. I have no idea what that is. That must mean it moves, instead of 90 degrees, it only moves a little bit. Never even heard of it. Prop size is 11 by seven and it runs on 2200 3S25C, which actually, that makes me think. We have 2200, I think we have a bunch of different variants of it and I thought we maybe had an Eros pack Yes, we do have an Aeros pack. Okay, so we have an Aeros 2200. So we'll go ahead and use their pack. This happens to be exactly what they call out. Um, this isn't a ready to fly, is it? It's just a no, bind and fly? It's a plug and fly. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one thing to keep in mind, guys, if you're using the chargers that we normally use, you may have to have some adapters. And so over the years, I've built little adapters like this. And we always just kind of jump into the battery. As soon as we find out about the battery, we always plug them in and get them charging. This S155 would be a great choice as a beginner because you've got both EC3 and EC5. So you can do some of these bigger smart packs or the smaller smart packs. And you can also charge the non-smart packs, which this would be one of. Now we normally use the S2200 because we like the flexibility that it comes with, but this is so much more economical. And if you want to have any smart technology, you're going to need to have a smart charger at some point. So this would be up to 4S. So we'll just show you how this works. You plug it in, same exact setup either way. It's already at uh, about 4.1, so I'll press play. And I'm going to scroll up and change 1.3. I'll go at 1C, so I'll go down, excuse me, up to 2.2, 2.2 amps. And it already auto detects how many cells it is. And then hit start. So then it says 92, and if you scroll down, you can see what the individual cell counts are. So that's how you set up a charge on a non-smart battery. If you have smart batteries, you just plug them in, they go. And of course, you can order all that stuff from HobbyZone.com, which is one of our wonderful partners that we work with, and we work with a variety of them. Uh, so they sent this out for review. So we're gonna go ahead and jump into it right now. We really wanna get access to a good pond so we can do float planes for you guys but on this one we're going to be doing it on the ground and that's usually the way we do planes but it is really cool to do stuff off of water you have to have enough power and it's always good to be able to see how things go in an environment like ours because we try to show you guys uh what each plane looks like oh our prop is loose that's kind of scary i hope it didn't damage anything mm. but look it's just chilling here mm. it's not damaged i can tell but i'm sure I'm hoping it didn't damage anything else. Okay, so 11.7, blunt edge, okay. So we'll put that there. I had somebody explain to me that the blunt edges are more efficient uh, and the rounded edges are quieter. And so on a lot of these bush airplanes, they'll use rounded edges because it's so loud for the pilot otherwise. Uh, so the blunt tips um, would be great for power and everything, but they're just too loud, I guess. Okay, so what we do with floats when we get them is we pull out the parts and we keep them for later. Looks like good sturdy hardware for the floats. This does have a uh, servo actuated rudder. So you don't have to put any linkages up to your actual rudder. And I'm just noticing this as I pull that open. We've got, I believe these will probably also work. 
Yep, those ones are gonna be the other part of the float equipment. So of course the floats. Floats are super fun on snow if you've never done it. But if you have floats that don't have this reinforcement on the bottom, you don't wanna use them on snow because they will tear themselves up. And it looks like these ones are, they're always super light, very simplistic design on this style. And the assembly is always really easy. You put the bigger one into this, you put the smaller one into that, and you've got a number of different set screws, and they just get assembled and they slide in similar to where the landing gear goes. Most of the time it's very simple, but just keep in mind, when you get to the radio setup, there'll usually be an, ex an extra port uh, for plugging in the rudder, because the water rudder is just a servo that's down in here, okay? So that is that. And what we usually do is we'll take these, if we know we're not gonna be using them right away, we'll put them together like this, and we wrap them up in foam, but we label them so that we can figure out which plane they belong to because they all look almost exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because the size class must be just right that almost all the floats end up being almost the same size. I mean, there's like basically the 1200 through 1500 millimeter size class and then everything else. Okay, so it's a wing joiner. Feels like fiberglass to me. So we'll put that, eh, it might be carbon fiber, it's hard to tell. Would that weird size servo be for the water rudder? It's possible. It's possible, but I honestly just don't know. Hmm. Um, a curved manual, ew. Not like we're gonna need the manual for too much on this. I do like the wheel pants on this, they look cool. And I'm kind of a sucker for general aviation aircraft. We love having general aviation aircraft. Um, kind of a lot of antennas and little fixtures. Those are probably steps, antennas, a few zip ties, a splitter which is probably for the floats because they won't include that if it doesn't come with floats. Spinner adapter, a couple of different quick release pins and some clevises. Okay, now we mentioned a coupon code earlier. We don't often mention them, but we just happen to know in this case that there is a coupon code available. So definitely navigate over to Brian Phillips RC and you can find all sorts of goodies there and we're trying to keep uh, coupon codes available there. As they come out, we'll do our best to keep them up to date. And then obviously we have the links to the airplanes down below in the video description. And then of course, this is your vector kind of information. Do I, there's the Chinese, okay. Yes, yep, sense. Okay, cool. So this is the nose gear, looks really nice actually. It's a beautiful nose gear. Very, very detailed. Hard wheel though, which is a bummer. Ooh, serviceable though, that's pretty sweet. So if you wanted to switch that out for something softer, you could hypothetically. I'd really like to get to where the manufacturers are providing us with a little bit better, softer wheels. That's one thing that all the manufacturers need to work on. Um, but I'll tell you what, we've been really satisfied with the planes. LEDs, that's very good. We have an inboard flap and an outboard aileron. So of course this would be that wing over there. And very nice uh, detail on the wing there. That little scoop on the end there. It's kind of like a winglet. Not sure what they call that uh, when it's just an integral flare on the end of the wing like that. But it's a nice wing, really sturdy. It feels feels super solid, hardly any twist, twist or flex in it. And you can definitely see the spar goes almost all the way out. It goes out to about there. So there's just not that much support needed here. And then this big plastic piece goes in, big plastic piece goes in, and that's where the screw for the nuts are, would pass through. So the wingspan of the airplane is gonna be added to the thickness of the fuselage. So we'll see that on some planes, we'll kinda of not see that on other planes. I'll actually put these out of the way over here because we know we're not gonna put those together. These uh, wing struts look like they're not just uh, pretty, they actually do something. So you can see here on, on these wing struts, there is a little bit of a difference on this end and that end. So pay close attention to that while you're putting them together. That's the type of thing you don't wanna get wrong on the first go around, have to redo it. Um, everything is really well kept in here. Good packaging with the exception of the prop. I'm not sure what the deal was with that. Uh, I think the prop was supposed to be in there, but it's kind of hard to tell. So far I don't see any damage, but I see a very pretty fuselage though. And if you look at this, look at the detailed scale lines here. That's really cool. And then the lines for the door, door details, love that. Not very many bumps and stuff, I love that. Looks so much nicer when they're smooth like this. Mm -hmm. And we've even seen some, you know, bigger brands coming out with planes that have a lot more of these little mold release bumps. 
See how there's one, two, three. I don't know why some have like virtually nil. It's probably got something to do with the complexity of the shape of the aircraft, but this thing is light, which is really good. Of course, brushless motor up here. And the cowl is removable, one, two screws, no tape, no decals to mess with, and just pure white. White is okay. Sometimes in clouds like this, you'll have a little bit of trouble disappearing, but I don't know that we're gonna have an issue with this just because there's so much contrast with that gray. And nice nut zerts in all the plastic. These are the types of things as a new pilot you're not gonna know to look for, but it's definitely valuable. So, and that's one of the things we strive to do here on Brian Phillips RC is in addition to the education that we provide, ooh, that vector's not straight. See how it's at an angle? If our plane walks, we're gonna rip that off and put it on straight. Nice mounting board, heavy duty straps, probably the middle of the road straps. You won't be able to rip them in half. Believe it or not, there are some Velcros out there that you can rip in half. This ESC is dinky. Look at that, 30 amp ESC. What, did they say 30 or 40? You read 30 on the box. Okay. You were, yeah. Uh, seems like a small ESC for a big plane, but you know what's nice about a small ESC? It means there's small power, which means you can fly it on a small battery. Look how big this plane is. Yeah. We're gonna be flying on 2200 3S. Now, there is one big advantage. Okay, that is a smaller elevator than the full length of the horizontal stabilizer. Nice and stiff, sturdy and strong, so that's good. Beginner planes are light, and they should be light, and if they're not light, they're gonna need a lot of power. And so that's why when people ask us questions like, should I get the Draco or whatever? We say, are you kidding me? But generally speaking, the heavier, more detailed, more scale they get, the harder they are to fly because you need more power and you need more skill. And you get bit harder when you get something wrong. Now you'll note that there's no landing gear out. I have to flip the box over. So what we like to do is when we get to a point like this, where we're sure we've got everything checked out and we've looked for all the nut and bolt sacks, Okay, I think we have everything on this side, so we should be able to flip this over. Oh, some tape came off on the bottom. Actually, that's perfect, because one of the things we have to do that you guys might not have to is when we get new planes, we go through so many of them, we have to deal with all the packaging. And it's, um, it's kind of a, it's a great problem to have, don't get me wrong, but uh, you guys have seen our basement a few times, and our basement tours or dungeon tours. All those planes that came to the house, at one point or another, came to us from somewhere. Okay, how the heck does that come out? Look, this comes out somehow. And it's, it's kind of like, no, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing to get that out. Okay, well, I guess that's it. There's just like a pressure fit, but beautiful landing gear, really nice. I hope they aren't noisy, but I bet they are. So, you hear how quiet that is? Yeah. Wow, it's a nice looking wheel. Molded details in the plastic. Oh yeah, really pretty. I like the matte white. Yeah, and I like that this is serviceable. You can mm -hmm. take the wheel pants off. Look, it's five screws. One, two, three, four, excuse me. One, two, three, four, five, six screws. Those are the screws that mount them together. But I like that you can take them apart. Now, I like the screws are on the inside for the accessibility so they look nicer, but that's gonna make it hard to get a screw out. <laughs> okay, so we're empty on the bottom. It looks like we've got it all taken care of. But what I was getting at before I flipped that box and got excited about the landing gear is we deal with all this weird packaging. And so, <laughs> we do. you know, for the average person, it's not a big deal. You know, you got five or six of these things a year. Well, try doing that with like 70 or 100 or 200 a year. It gets to be in kind of a big thing. So we have been learning for years on how to deal with that. And we've gotten a little better. This looks like it's gonna be an easy build though. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we have some extra hardware on this build too, because remember, we got the floats that are available. We're gonna be doing ours with landing gear, so I think we'll just show it with a, a plane stand. This plane stand is just something, if you guys are new to the hobby, it's inexpensive. I think they go for about 20 to $30. And there's a couple of different varieties out there. One of our subscribers actually sent this to us because he watched us struggle for years using like, you know, nap, well, what we're, using, we're using like blankets <laughs> and uh, that sort of thing. Okay, so you just set it on there get it adjusted so that it fits well, and then you're ready to rock and roll. Okay, so assembly should be pretty straightforward. There's pockets here where the wires are gonna go in on the wings. Let's go ahead and work on probably the tail section first. I'll put the canopy back on. Um, super simple canopy design, just got a spring-loaded plastic. If that breaks, that's gonna be a bad day for you, so try not to break it. 
if you would happen to break that, you can put tape along here and make a strap to keep it. And then you can tape the top. It'd be a pain, but you can get by for a couple of days until you have a chance to order a replacement. Okay, now these things are zip tied here, so we're gonna have to cut those. So I'll get some side cutters and just kind of keep track mentally of, of the different tools that we need to use because if you guys end up buying uh, one of these models, you have to make sure you have some tools. Now you can use scissors if you want, but uh, side cutters are gonna be a little bit more of the correct choice for cutting these. Just make sure you don't cut your wires and just get those zip ties freed up. Now these are all labeled for you. So you've got something, then you've got LEDs, what, gear and flaps. Uh, pretty sure they got that backward. Mm. Why would, why would the two wires, the two wires a hundred percent go to the light. Okay. So I'm pretty sure that the gear is not gear, but I'm wondering if that's actually where they are supposed to land inside the wing. Let's cut the other wing apart. Maybe it was just a typographical thing. If yours doesn't say gear, then you probably, they got it right on yours and they got it wrong on ours. Not really a big deal, but sometimes they put the wrong label on the inside too. So then you match up the wrong to the wrong and two wrongs in this case would make a right. Okay, so we're just gonna stretch those out a little bit. Looks like they labeled those as gear too. So I wonder if they probably just labeled the wrong thing, but we'll find out here briefly. Uh, all right, so we've got landing gear and we've got the mains and we've got the wire ties cut. And we've got the tail. I think it's gonna be easier to do the tail while there's not wings attached. So let's see if we can figure this out without the manual. And if we need the manual, we'll jump into it. These are all the attachment points for the float. So we won't need to get inside of there. Okay, so just looking at the tail, sometimes for us, we'll do this a little bit different so that the camera crew can get a better angle at it. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna pass this down into this channel. Super easy. The horizontal stabilizer is gonna be supported by one screw, it's gonna keep it in place. And then this linkage will attach here for the elevator. So if you're curious about how we do all these builds, if you check out any of the planes that we have on Brian Phillips RC, well, with some little exception on the very oldest stuff, we should have a video for the unbox build radio setup, which is what you're watching now. And okay, so you're gonna have to turn the rudder one way or another. I'm just gonna push it because it's a little easier. And you can see access to the hole there. Okay. And then they always, on the good manufacturers, they staple these Ziploc bags shut, which is, I usually uh, try to save everything because I'm a huge cheapskate. So then I can reuse these bags for something else later. And right, so we're gonna dump this all out. Comes with tons of goodies in here. Now don't worry, you don't have to use 100% of this, but there is definitely a few things you're gonna want. Like we'll probably plug the holes on the aircraft uh, for the floats even though we're not doing floats. And then these are gonna be like a decorative thing for, for steps. Here's the flap Y splitter, and this one's gonna be the one that's the rudder. So it gives you something to plug in your water rudder. And then this is for your battery, which we'll talk about a little later. It's some Velcro or hook and loop. This is for the spinner. So that's gonna go like that. It's gonna help hold the spinner onto the motor and it's got that octagonal shaft adapter. And then this thing, of course, is gonna go into that. It's got kind of that same octagonal, octagonal and octagonal. Then this goes over the top and everything gets held together with this thing, which is in the nut and bolt sack. Okay, lots of little, these little set screws are not gonna get used in our application more than likely. See, I'm just setting those in there. That's what you gotta do when you first open these things. If you know there's a bunch of set screws, those things are dinky and easy to lose. Gosh, it gave us a lot of them too. I think there should be two for each connection point. So eight maybe? Yeah, that sounds right. So okay. usually they give you an odd number. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, so I have eight. So there's probably not eight needed. This is actually what holds the prop on. Okay. And that's the nut that assembles it on. So actually we can do that right now before we get back to the tail. If you okay. wanna just stay right there. That way I don't forget. Okay, so the prop adapter is super easy. There's already this thing that comes out of the motor, the brushless motor that's screwed onto the front of the stator. Okay, so it just slides back. So it's nice flush fit, really nice gap. And this slides on and you're like, but that can't be. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Super simple assembly. 
Make sure your words, the print goes forward. And then when you turn this counterclockwise, that's the normal rotation direction. If you have a counter rotating prop on a plane with two props, you know, one spins this way, one spins that, you have to pay closer attention. But this one's gonna go like that. If you have a reverse threaded, it's gonna go counterclockwise. Excuse me, it'll go clockwise if it's, um, you know, the other counter rotation, if you have that, if this threads on backward, okay? But otherwise that's gonna go counterclockwise. That's the normal method. And what we like to do is we have this thing that normally holds flowers, a vase, and we just uh, go ahead and use it to help get everything assembled. We've got a bunch of these Chinese screwdrivers that we've gotten from a million different planes that we've done over the years and they just end up working out good. But we've also got stuff like this. These are like crappy cheap tool shop from Menards. You may not have Menards in your area. It's like Home Depot or Lowe's, but it's a cheap garbagey brand. Okay, so now there's a bunch of screws here. Let's take a look at these. This obviously goes to the elevator. We've already talked about that. There's a bunch of these little quick decouples. See all these? They're all the same size. Then there's some longer ones. Then there's the other short ones. See how they're all the same though? Mm -hmm. Oop, here's another one. I just about guarantee you those are for the landing gear. And then there's two long screws. My guess is one of the long screws goes to the prop. And why do we know that? Because if you had a short one in there, I don't think you'd reach very far. So let's go back around and check that out. So the longer one, I don't know if we need the longer one, but this is how I usually cheat if I don't have the instructions. It looks like that longer one might be unnecessary. Hmm. I'm not sure. I wonder where the long one goes. Maybe the long one goes in the tail. That would be me. They usually give us one extra. Yeah, there's usually so. one extra, but not always. Okay, we do have instructions in this one. So we're gonna go ahead and look at those real quick. This is just for the stabilizer. And we'll talk about that more as we get to it. So this is actually one of the things that's nice about working with uh, arrows and good competitive brands. Okay, so this is 3S, 2200, 25C. This speaks to the number of cells, three cells. That's how much capacity each of those three cells have. And then that's the charge rate. Okay, so it looks like short for the landing gear, short for the landing gear, mm -hmm. long for the tail, okay? So just looking quick at the drawing. And then this is gonna be a 1.5 millimeter almost certainly. And we just know that from having built a million of these things, you get used to, whoops, not 1.5. That must be a two. So two millimeters goes in there perfect. And these, that is not lined up. It was lined up, I felt like, but now it doesn't feel lined up. Yeah, it is. So this is gonna be a challenging one to drive in because you see the angle of the tail puts the rudder in the way. So I'm actually gonna pull this out and I'm gonna just put it in by finger and then we'll get that started and we can go in there and kind of finish it up when we get it down a little bit. Once it's down a little bit, I'll have an easier time with the driver. This is where the antennas go, see? And the only reason I figured that out is because I looked over your shoulder and looked at the, uh, look at the box. Mm -hmm. Looks like, hey, See oh. this? This one goes right there. And then this one, this one goes right here. And then that bent antenna goes on the bottom. So now one thing to keep in mind, if you're a new pilot, you may not be thinking about this because you're new. Um, those antenna are cool looking, but you don't have to put them on. They don't do anything. It's just a fun, cool scale feature. And they'll make it really hard to transport sometimes because a lot of these planes, you're gonna end up putting them upside down. And if you're trying to figure out how the heck do you get this thing to the flying field? Well, for us, we built our flying field and we live here, so it works really nice. But the thing is, if you have to go to a, a local park or whatever, then one of the ways you can do it is we've always found that having bean bags, kids bean bags with the softest fabric you can get. We'll throw one plane on the bottom, then we maybe a low wing, then we'll throw a bean bag on top, then we throw another plane on top, and then we'll sandwich another bean bag on top of that. And the next thing you know, you get five or six of them in the back of your SUV. And it works really nice. If you've got a car, it's a little bit tighter, obviously. Now the spinner, we're gonna attach this as spinner. Of course, we were working on that earlier and got distracted by the elevator. This can go on here. We'll just see if one of those shorties works because we've only got two of the longer ones. If this doesn't work, then we'll just go to the longer one. There's only two solutions. Oh yeah, yeah, it's biting. So yeah, if you've got a smaller car, then you have to really be careful about how big. This is a big wingspan 
Over here, we've got a competitive offering that's in a, a 1.5 meter size class. So when we're done, we'll show them side by side, just to give you an idea of size. And then we've got some 1,000 millimeters here on the ground. And then I think that one's a, like a 1,100 millimeters. So you're right in the middle of the sweet spot for this kind of like entry level um, price and flight style point. We love this size. It's a good size. It gives you enough size to get the feel of the aircraft without being, um, you know, basically too small to be able to handle no wind and that sort of stuff. The bigger planes do a little bit better on wind, depending on the style, I should say. Okay, now these things go in here and they look like they click in. So now that we have the horizontal stabilizer on, we have not hooked up the elevator, as you see here. We're not gonna hook that up until we're in radio setup. We'll come back to it. Okay, but then under here, there's like a spot where this is gonna go in and I'm not sure how that's gonna work because this thing clicks in somewhere. You see in the drawing, it shows it underneath. And I think it actually goes, it goes in, does it go in there? No, that's not it. Does it go in somewhere with the gear? Yeah, that's what I was kind of thinking. Now this goes on the bottom. And you can glue these in or you can just pressure fit them. It looks like they're pressure fitting nicely. So I kind of, I oh, will probably still put a drip of glue on there just so we don't lose them. But if you look over here, camera crew, you can see, um, it's talking about gluing these, what? Oh, into that little notch thing? Where? Like right there? Mm -hmm. There, oh, that's how it goes. Really? I don't have to glue that, but whatever. We'll glue it since that's what they suggest. And we were just talking about getting a drip of glue anyway. So what type of glue will you use, Brian? I'm gonna use foam to foam, but you could use a CA probably better. Um, the reason I'm using foam to foam is because I don't wanna go get CA. And CA is, uh, it's basically like a super glue. And when you use CA on plastic, it's brittle. And so this stuff is actually what, uh, similar to what they use to assemble the fuselage halves. You see how there's a seam here, guys, in China or wherever this thing's built, they, they build them in two halves and then they stick them together. And so all I'm gonna do, I'll just show you that the normal process is you, you kind of cake that stuff on there and really kind of get it on thick. This stuff is, is juicy when it comes out of the tube, but some of the, the glues like this are gonna be way less juicy. And this is a contact cement. Ooh, are they the same? Yes, they are the same. And so what happens is you have to be aware of which type of material you're bonding together. This will bond plastic to foam or foam to foam or plastic to wood or wood to foam or wood to wood or whatever you want. It works pretty good because of the contact adhesive nature. But the way the contact adhesive works is you're supposed to apply it to the joint and then let it dry a little bit. And then you put it back on there. And it seems a little bit counterintuitive, but it'll make sense once you've done it a number of times. Okay, so same thing here, just a little teeny bit on the very tip then you slide it in there and you just kind of let it coat the hole and then you pull it out and let it sit and air dry for a minute. And it's, it's incredible how strong that contact will be. That's literally how they do the plane. They build the plane the same way. I'm gonna turn that prop so that it prevents it from, this is kind of a slick model. There's definitely some mold release on there. So if you look at this one, this one doesn't have much for pressure. I'm actually gonna shoot the glue into the hole on this one. And I did a little bit too much and that's fine. So I'm just gonna coat that. It's probably really hard to see because it's clear on white. And then just let it set for a few minutes. It's not really hard at all. Now, if you were using CA, you could use CA and kicker. And the kicker is also called an accelerator. And that accelerator accelerates the process of the glue curing. It, it excites the chemical reaction. Now that stuff needs to sit for maybe two or three minutes. It's not like a long time it takes, but then it will stick together like tacking an envelope shut. You won't be able to take it apart. If you take it apart, you'll rip out foam. Maybe not on this, plastic to foam, you've got enough strength in that foam, you can pull it apart. But if you have two foam pieces you put together with that stuff, you'll pull it and it'll just like barely separate. And uh, you'd be surprised, I could like take and put it on my finger and let it dry, and then I could pick up this whole model and it would stick to my finger. So. All right, cool, so we have that done. So now let's go ahead and do the mains while we let that glue cure for a minute. So the mains, meaning this, are gonna go here, okay? And how do you know where the mains go versus where the floats go? 
I know from looking at the way the plastic is molded, but uh, you know, if you really wanted to test it, you could try there, but you could also set it up as a tail dragger if you put it up front. Should be kind of cool. Hmm. It's not designed as a tail dragger, but that would get you in front of the center of gravity. This is where this goes because look how the molding lines up, okay? Then I'm gonna grab this plastic here. These plastic pieces have a correct way and an incorrect way. That's correct. I'll show you what incorrect looks like and you'll know what you're, what you're doing when you see, see how it's lipped up on the edge. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just put it whichever way until it goes right. I mean, it's kind of a guess and check, but if you look real close, there's an angle on it. So you take your flat plane and you've got an angle. That'll kind of help you figure out where to go. See, that's the wrong one. So that one goes up here. And you're like, but Brian, you're not putting floats on. That's correct, and that's the only way it goes. So there's actually several different ways that these are contoured. And uh, so you just kind of guess and check until you get it right. All right, that glue's probably getting pretty close, so. I'm gonna go ahead and start putting those back in the hole. Now watch this. Okay, this, oh, this is the bent one, isn't it? Yes. The bent one? Okay, watch, here's the bent one. Wait, wait, no. Is it the bent one? It is the bent one, right? No, it's not that one. It is. Is it? Yeah. Hold on, I feel like it's not right. And I'm sorry, cam crew, I'm, um, let's, put, let's put these in. These ones, I know where they go. Okay, so they go here. Excuse me, here. Yeah, I don't know if I could lift it up by that, but I'll show you with the other ones. I'll be able to lift it up. One is keyed and one is not. That's how you can tell. One has a T, one doesn't. I just figured that out. Now, since it's plastic on plastic, see how I just rubbed that stuff out of there? And you can just take it right off like that. Now, because we have a million of these little screws before we pick it back up, I'm just gonna take that. Now, I don't use a drill, but you could use a drill. Just remember, do not get down and with an impact and try to tighten these, you will break something, I guarantee it. But if you use an impact and you do it, you can do it really fast and that's cool. I get the advantages there. I'm starting these so that I can get those antennas in because those antennas are gonna give us problems if we take too much longer. Also, you'll note that I'm not using Loctite. Loctite is your enemy plastic and Loctite do not agree. You will break down the plastic. I guarantee it, they will break, it will get brittle, it will crack, you will lose your stuff. So don't do it. No matter how much you think you need to, you don't need to. Okay, so I, I just am gonna throw a caution to the wind, okay? Look. <laughs> this is the whole plane by the antenna. It's just barely coming out, okay? I don't wanna break the plane just to prove a point. But as you can see, this one's big enough, I could probably pick the plane up. See, I can barely slide it in now. Okay, that's, that's what foam to foam does. Mucilage will do the same thing, okay? See, that one's not quite as tacked up as the other ones because I must have got a lot more of that contact adhesive in the hole. This one, yeah, it's just starting to pull off. You can, Five minutes that stuff will probably be able to pick up a plane by it okay cool so we'll flip this back over and keep working if you wait too long it makes it very hard to to get them in the hole so you can actually put more foam to foam over the top of the contact adhesive and it the the solvent nature will sort of work with the foam to foam that's there now if you get one that you get glue on and you forget about it and you're like oh crap what do i do now just put a little more on try to slide in it if you can't defeat it and you've got too much on there, you can try to dry it, rub it off, or you could take uh, accelerant, the CA accelerant, and you can spray it on that plastic and it will wipe off, it'll break down. So if you put kicker right here, accelerant, that will break down that glue because it will wick into the hole and you will find that it's very weak all of a sudden. Okay, cool, now we can just tighten these screws. There's quite a few of them. Shouldn't take too much effort. Very easy assembly so far, I mean, super, super easy. So if you're new to the hobby and you're just coming in for the first time, welcome to Brian Phillips RC. My wife and wonderful camera crew is the one behind the camera, of course. She does occasionally fly, but only under the most demanding circumstances. <laughs> she hates to fly in front of people. I am obsessive with this hobby. She tolerates it because I love it. And, uh, but she is very good with camera work, which is something we found out before too long in this endeavor. Okay, so that has three holes. So that, I'm just literally dropping down. 
And for that, I'm gonna just look at the instructions, make sure there's not anything we have to do inside first. Looks like you just drop it down in there. Pretty simple stuff. Okay, cool, like I said, super, super easy build. All right, three screws. Now you'll note that that screw is gonna be rather hard to get to, correct? Oh, yes. Yeah, so what yes. I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drop this into the hole prior to our arrangement in completion. And I do not know how I'm gonna get it tightened. I think we're gonna have to turn it. So once we get this all the way in, We'll just get a couple of these started and then I'll have to take and turn that, that servo, which is hard on them. Don't turn the servos for no reason. Okay, get that started and then, oh, that's so nasty on your servos. You don't wanna do that, guys. But that's just a means to an end because I gotta get to the screw at some point. It, the best thing you can do is actually take a servo tester and just, you know, move the servo with the servo tester or get it radio set up, uh, radio set up step and then turn it. But for the sake of time, hear that noise? It's really hard on your servos. You can blow them out, but so far it's doing well. That looks absolutely gorgeous. Really happy with that. Okay, cool. So now I think we may not need the plane stand anymore, but we'll see. See, it's gonna be hard to actually put it on the plane stand because that nose gear protrudes out so mm, far. Okay. So let's kind of set this out of the way. Um, okay, so wings, wings should be pretty straightforward process, but if you guys aren't aware of how this works, what you're gonna do is you have a wing joiner that goes in and it slides in between both left and right sides and then the wires have to get fed through. So we'll just kind of start with whichever one, this is a zip tie I cut off earlier. I'm gonna lay this in position and then I'm gonna take these wires. I'm actually gonna take the wing joiner and slide it through the fuse. Just make sure we don't have any problems getting that through. Sometimes if you don't dry fit stuff, you'll realize there's you know, like a real sharp edge or something makes it hard to start. Okay, so I'll just put that on there loose. Then I'm gonna take these wires and I can push this all the way through. See what I've done here? Now I can pass these wires through in such a way that it's quite easy to find them. Okay. You can go back to where you were, you can see better. Okay, there you go. So now I've got those going through and then these will just slide into the sockets, or the receptacles, whatever you wanna call those things. I just need a little teeny bit more. Can you hold that plane, please? So we'll just get that in there. And there we go. Now the reason we did it that way is just, now the three wires are gonna be inside the wing and we'll just get these two screws secured and then we can, we can work out the other side. First time is always the most challenging but the alignment has been perfect. We haven't had any issues yet. Okay. So now I need to turn this, so you're gonna have to, can you grab that kit? Put it over here. There we go. Okay, so now these wires, it's kind of sliding along the shaft. So what I have to do is I have to take these and gather them up and pass them through this opening. Same as we did on the other side, but you see now this kind of helps to balance the plane. Can you hold the center of the, fuse, like just hold it tight. Okay, thank you. It just wanted to tip on me. Okay, let go. Maybe I can put that in my shirt. It's just wanting to tip on me is all. Can I hold it from You can under? also just do this. Once you get them through the fuse, there's about this far and then they're in. And I'm just uh, struggling because it's tangling on itself. Once they're through, it's super easy. Oh, there we go. The other side evidently had a little bit less memory on the cables. See, I've, I'm pulling them from the inside now. Once you get, you get your hands on them, it's super easy. Just mostly just tripping over the wires is all. You don't wanna get those wires in that pinch point. Okay. So now that's in the hole. The canopy's back on for ease of looks. And then two more screws. So. 
Assembly was not hard at all, but there is technically a little bit more, I guess I should say. That one went in kind of tough. If they go in tough, you can use a little bit of dish soap or hand soap and uh, you can lubricate the threads. But we generally don't have a big problem. This one's the only one that's been tight. Okay. Probably just got a little glue in the threads. Now, you'll note that they move a little bit like this, like a bird. That's because we have wing struts. The wing struts, and I just wanna watch for my antenna as I lay this down. So the wing struts are gonna be super easy to put on because you don't even have to put a screw in. Okay, so this, see how this is flat and this is not? Okay, that's correct. That would be, wait, that's correct, right? That looks better. Fits tighter than this, see? That's not right. That's right. That's the way that's supposed to go because it's a nice contoured shape. Boy, that is a really well side. I mean, it's just like a perfect fit. Okay, so we've got these pins, these little cotter pins. And so you'll just slip those on. I kind of wanted to go this way just so they can't pop out uh, very easily. And these toolless install items are really nice. The trouble is, in order to do this, you're gonna need to screw, like if you were taking the wing off, you would have to undo a screw too. Now I'm gonna show you another trick. If you don't have this tool, you might wanna think about it. It's probably something you don't have, um, unless you're a creature of the 70s. It's forceps, hemostats. The bent tips are the ones you always use, by the way. <laughs> In case you're wondering, I thought I'd never use the bent tip ones. So I'll grab these and I can push them through and it's just like, just super easy work then. Makes easy work of that step. Okay, same thing on the bottom of each wing. You'll just put it over the top. Could you maybe resist that for me? Hold the fuse down. Okay. It's wanting to spin on there. There we go. Goodness gracious. Okay, so just having trouble getting alignment of that hole. It's not bad. There we go. Okay, so that's as that's simple as that. Same thing over here. The biggest problem is it's wanting to spin in our plane stand. And because we mounted the antennas at first, I could have just laid this plop right on the counter, but I wanted to show you the antenna install. Uh, so that I could kill some time doing other steps. Okay, cool. So now the wing is fully installed. This plane is built. It is assembled fully. Now we just need to do the radio setup, which is gonna take technically a couple of assembly steps because of the Y splitters. Um, so if you guys are not familiar with what a plug and fly plane is, that's what we're dealing with, our plug and play, plug and fly. Most of the manufacturers say plug and play and plug and play meaning you, you plug in the wires and then you, you fly it. But as we can tell from this video, this educational video, um, we definitely were doing a lot more than plugging. You know, we were bolting and screwing and gluing. And so there is a little bit of assembly left, but not a big deal, nothing too crazy. Okay, cool, come on over. Okay, so just looking at these wires that came through, we've got these wires and these wires that came through. Okay, so there's, uh, oh, let's talk about extra parts too. Extra, 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 not extra. We just haven't installed it yet. And then a couple of extra zip ties. So we'll just lay those aside for now. Those are standard extras that are provided. Now this says rudder and there's the electronic speed control. That's the power wire. So that comes out this hole. I don't really know for sure how I want, oh, there's a bulkhead here. So it has to come out that opening. This is the steerable nose gear, so that'll come out of the rudder. This is the S-Bus mode, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, then we have throttle, then we have aileron, then we have elevator, we have rudder. Okay, so these things are the ones that are gonna plug into your receiver. Those things need to plug to what's up here on the ceiling, if you will. So that's where this uh, really comes in handy. 
because it's kind of a long reach. Okay, so we have these. That's the red wires. Okay, so what do we have here? This one is plugged into, oh gosh, I can't tell. That says signal plus minus. The next one over is aileron. That's rudder. That is throttle. What's, this is the second one. And I can't read what the tag says. It says gear. That says gear, actually. This one says ailerons. The first one says, oh, that's just a label for signal plus and minus. Okay, so that's just a label for signal plus and minus. I'm on aileron there. Okay, so aileron is unmarked. Aileron is unmarked and that makes sense. I might actually take a seat so I can get down low and get out of the camera crew's way here. Is that better? Okay, so aileron is this first Y splitter here. So you see how there's a brown and there's a red and there's a yellow, okay? Doesn't matter which one's which, they're unlabeled, but there's a left and a right aileron. And so we're gonna be hooking up the ailerons here. Here's an aileron. Now the brown, oh, I got that backward. I wanna try to pick it up the other way if I can. So I'm just using the forceps to rearrange the pick point here. Now don't grab onto your wires, you'll cut right through them if you use forceps like that. Okay. You see why it's so nice to have these things? It's kind of incredible how nice it is. Because if you're doing this with your bare hands and you've got bare hands like me, you're gonna have a real heck of a time. However, I've got a bad angle on that, so I'm gonna release and see if I can grab it straight on. See, I can even clip onto it, and these things have teeth that hold on really good. So you can pinch it and let go of the end. So now this just needs to slide together and so I can brace it really hard because I'm holding the plastic now. And then you just have to get those things together, okay? So then you go, I'm gonna let go and I'm gonna recouple and then push a little bit and then let go. Now that they're kind of together, I can go in here and verify that we're hooked and I believe we're hooked. So you see I can get one hand in there, I just can't get two in there, right? Okay, so now the second wire we need to do is also another servo wire that's coming off of that same plug and that's called the, the ailerons. Of course, the ailerons are these things. They roll the aircraft. One goes up while the other one goes down and they always do the opposite in an aileron, okay? Okay, so I grabbed this one here. See how I grabbed it just by the very edge I'm just gonna feed that in. And I know my brown is on my left and my brown is on my left. Once I know that the brown is on the same side, then I should be good to go to push this in. Now I'm kind of nursing a bit of an injury on my thumb here, you may have noticed. And so if you see me doing things a little bit weird, it's because I'm trying to protect that weird injured thumb. I just squished it the other day at work. Okay, so here is, this says gear because it's gonna go into the gear split channel, I guess. I don't know why. And then one of these is gonna say, see here's gear. There's flap. So flap and flap come together in a Y cable. Now why don't they go down to that, uh, that vector box camera crew? Because they're not controlled by the stabilizer. So they just go straight to the receiver. Yep, they, they don't interact with the stabilizer because there's no stabilization that occurs on the flaps. Stabilization occurs on the primary three axis of roll, pitch, well in this case, pitch, and then yaw from the rudder. The rudder is also hooked up to the steerable, steerable nose gear. Okay, so brown goes up. This is called a Y splitter or servo, servo splitter, okay? And they've got these little teeth on them that help catch. Not all servo splitters are created equal, by the way. Okay, so those ones, help it so that it won't come undone until you lift one or the other and then you can kind of pull and then you lift the other and it comes undone. Okay, but you have to really work at it, okay? That still does not stop you from yanking the whole thing out. 
All right, so just understanding what I did there, I don't like the way the cables were managed, so I'm gonna go ahead and just gently tug on that. I'm gonna pull this out to the front, and that's because those are gonna be a bit of a tangled mess if I don't do that now. Okay, so this will be ready to receive the plug into our receiver. So now we've got two plugs left, and you'll notice I'm just kind of working my way through, and you're like, well, but how do you know where everything plugs in, Brian? You just read what it says on the label and go forth and prosper. It's not super hard. I mean, the first couple, it's gonna be a little bit more of a challenge, especially if you don't know a lot about airplanes. But my guess is if you're you know, into radio controlled airplanes, you know a little bit about airplanes, not a lot necessarily. Or maybe you're a full scale aviation nut and you just haven't ever done radio controlled stuff. Well, a lot of the stuff we talk about is all based on real stuff. Okay, gear. So there's two wires that go to gear. Why do we have landing gear plugs on the wing? For the LEDs. Yep. But why are they labeled gear? Because they don't have that channel. Yep. yep. That's where they're going to steal the power. Yep. Or not the, they're going to steal power from that channel. So you see this, how this has a black and a red. So if you look at one that's a little bit more accessible, like this splitter cable, we're going to be plugging into something just like this. Okay. So it's exactly the same as the gear one down there. You're gonna plug in the brown is gonna line up. Oh, there's the tractor out there. The brown's gonna go down and the red's gonna go in the middle. Sure. Okay. Just like that, okay? And that's that. That's the way that's gonna go. Because there is no signal, right? Right. So if you knew for sure what is he lost or something? <laughs> Just went up the road. Um, okay, so we'll go ahead and grab the gear splitter. And I wanna be careful how I do this so I don't cause a tangled mess for myself. The brown is up. So I'm gonna just see if I can do this. I'm sorry, I gotta make myself so I can see That's if like you're gonna have to move around. Way down in there. I know. Okay, so push that in, it's plugged in but it doesn't feel super robust or strong, so I'm a little bit nervous it's gonna wanna pop out. And by the way, for your information, since you're not taking signal, you can actually Y off of any channel. Okay, so this one here, we'll just slide it up so you can see the black needs to go up because our brown happens to be up on this splitter. Okay, I don't care about that one that's plugged in already. Just wanna try to grab it vertical like that so it's easy. Black needs to go up and I want it to be at the top. You're probably thinking to yourself, how do, you, how do you know all that stuff? Well, if you just watch along with the videos for a little bit, you'll figure out some of these details. If you're a new pilot, there is a lot to learn and you are not alone. You're not the first one that's been confused and you're certainly not the last one. So stick around, we'll try to help you through it and help you get up to speed. Boy, that didn't wanna go in very good. There, there it goes. Okay, so now those are plugged in. So when we plug in the power, there's um, this little electronic speed controller that's down here, right here. That's actually what pulls power from the battery, converts it into the power that's used for the motor, which is like AC power, essentially, but it's not. It's um, timed DC power, but either way, it's like AC power. Then out of that comes also the BEC, which is going back through this wire all the way back to the vector, okay? The vector is stealing its necessary power from the BEC, the battery eliminator circuit is like another power supply. And it takes whatever voltage pack we put in here within range, and it kicks out the right number of volts to run the servos and the radio system, which would be generally five to six volts. Sometimes there's high, they're called high voltage. You'll go to like seven or 8.4 or something like that. It just depends on what your servos call for. In this case, in this type of environment, most of what we deal with is gonna be five, 5.5 or six volts. And then sometimes there's a little bit more current on the BEC, but in this case, this is probably a five volt at about three amps, okay? I don't know what the spec is and it doesn't really matter, but if you look at that, you can probably see. I cannot see it's extremely small print or I would read it to you. So that's all done behind the scenes. You don't need to mess with it at all. And then if you get ready to actually plug in your rudder, then there's actually a plug in here that goes out to here. And so you can actually plug that in there and you can Y off to your rudder for your water rudder. 
Okay. So in this case, I'm going to put that with my water kit mm -hmm. and I'll have that available. And I always write down what type of plane it is that it goes with so that I can figure out what components I've packed up. So for instance, some of them already have that Y splitter in the plane, so I won't need it on a, a timber or whatever it happens to be. Okay. So this is going outside. Now, the next step we have to do is we have to get our receiver installed, which is going to take a little bit more work. And we're going to come right back and talk all about it. All right, so we're going to set up the radio. And so in our case, we have a transmitter and we have a stabilizer, but we don't have a receiver. So that's what this thing is. And uh, so when you're buying a plane that's plug and fly, you have to provide your transmitter and receiver, and then you have to provide your battery. And this is the battery that we started off with and it's done. It says it's at hundred percent now. So if you look right here, we have about 4.2 volts, 4.2. And as you can see, it's basically each of the cells. It's just right where it needs to be. So what we can do is we can go ahead and just unplug this. It's done. Okay. And unplug the balance lead and then it loses its data. And then this little adapter can set aside. And in this case, there's no power switch. So I have to unplug that because I don't want to leave it on. If you had this one, you could do it a lot quicker because you would just have a power switch. But this one has Velcro on it. I am not a big proponent of Velcro. So we'll show you a trick here in a minute, but we do have the battery ready, which we're going to need. The plane comes with Velcro. So you have to provide your transmitter receiver, even though this has a transmitter and receiver in it because there is telemetry that gets fed back to here. It's sort of useless telemetry in this regard, but at any rate, both of these are transmitting and receiving with the predominant transmitter being here and the secondary transmitter being here. So if you're old tech and you're just coming back, you know a lot about aircraft, about radio controlled, but you're like, man, this is all new stuff. It's Brian, you're overwhelming me. Don't worry, it takes a little bit of time. Just stick with us, okay? If it's not just this plane and maybe it's the next plane, we'll step on to the landmine that you're wanting to know the answer to, okay? And also we try to answer questions on this uh, channel, but it is getting increasingly difficult because there's just so many of them, uh, but we'll try our best. All right, we do dig, dig in, it's long videos. Okay, so we're gonna power on our transmitter. It's the first step of setting up the radio is to power on your transmitter. You're like, why do you need to power on the transmitter to install the radio? Well, the reason you plug, you, you turn this on is we have to set up a model profile because this just doesn't run one plane. We have 119 planes in this right now. So that plane, that plane, that plane, that plane, that plane, that plane, those helicopters, half of them, that plane, and then there's hundreds more downstairs, okay? Literally. Okay, so the first step is you have to build a profile. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit back and cancel, which is this and this, but I can't show you the plane that's on there because it's an early release. I'm gonna go to add new model and I'm gonna click yes. Okay, you can show now. So now it says, create new model. Do you wanna create a new model? Yep, create. Okay, so then it's gonna create a model. It does sit here for a few seconds. You're like, what the heck is going on? Are you like busy in there? What are you doing? Well, it's creating a new model, evidently. So it does, okay, so there it goes. And you also notice that the RF goes off. That's signified by this orange. So model select would take you right back to where you came from. Model type, that's what we just set. If you redo this, it'll re-clear your model and model name. So this is the 120th model. You can change the numbers. And then we use a legacy keyboard just so you know. If you like the legacy keyboard, it's in the system setup. So we're gonna type in Technim 2010 right there. And we're gonna come right back. Okay, so we have the Technum 2010, 1450 millimeter. And you're like, well, why do you put the size? because then when you get another Technum 2010 that's a 700 millimeter, or, or you get a Technum 2010 that's 2,200 millimeters, you can designate that way. And yes, I do have that problem. It's a great problem to have. Aircraft type, this speaks to the wing, not, the, not to be confused with model type, okay? Aircraft type, model type speaks to airplane, helicopter, drone, or some other creation, okay? Aircraft type. So in this case, we have a one flap and one aileron. But Brian, there's two ailerons and two flaps. Nope, there's one channel and another channel. One channel controls the flaps together because they operate in the same direction. And then the ailerons are hooked together and they, oper they, they operate in opposite directions, meaning you only have one channel. Now, 
to be fair, you could operate a full length flap or a full length flap on or a crow configuration where the ailerons go up, they act as spoilerons, and then the flaps go down, and that would require four channels, different type of wing, okay? So for something like that, you would need to do that. But in order to do that, you would need a different type of stabilizer. So instead of using something like this, like we're gonna use, you would tear out the reflex and you would put in something like the AR, I think you would need the 637, or you'd you need, need the 80, 80. 8230, because mm -hmm. you'd have enough channels. So just so you guys understand, there is a way to do it, it's just you can't do it in this configuration, okay? Or at least you can't have stabilization on both of those surfaces, because you can actually set it up this way, and you can run the additional channel, because you have one additional channel on this, but you won't have stabilization through that channel, okay? All right, so then anyway, so not to confuse things, we have a regular tail, obviously it looks and feels the same. And this is the picture that they recommend. I'm gonna show, oh, that was, oh, just trying to find one that's close, close match, that's pretty close. Do they have a tricycle in here? I don't think they do. That's yeah, probably, whatever, it's all about the same. How about that? Okay, and then flight mode, we don't need to set up flight modes because our reflex is gonna do all the controls for modes and we'll just assign it to a switch. But if you want it to say it on the screen, you can set up flight modes. And if you did set it up, then you would see it on the screen right here, flight mode one, flight mode two, flight mode three, and you can name them. So you could have like stabilized, normal, auto leveling, okay? And then you can make it call that out audibly, okay? I don't really care that much. It's not that big a deal and it's not crucial for you in this environment as a new player, a, a, a new RC flyer, but it would be helpful, especially for the mode. And so we might talk about it for that reason, but I'll show you how to do it as an audible and not necessarily as a flight mode. Flight mode is more reserved for when you really need to have different trim packages set up for each of those settings and all that stuff. So in this case, it's so simple, we'll just assign it to a switch and we'll, we'll show you how to do that right now. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is now that we're out in function list, you can see we're in the normal flight mode and uh, there's not much going on here. These are the trims. If you scroll over one, this is a scroll bar. You can click it or you can scroll. So it's like a mouse clicker. And there's uh, different information. There's only two screens here, but the more advanced your radio setup is, the more of those screens you're gonna have. Some of our most advanced planes have like 15, 20 screens. Okay, and here you can see what the position of all these different control surfaces are and all the switches, if they're assigned, what they're gonna do, okay? So just to be clear, we're gonna start by setting up all the switches, but we'll go ahead and do dual rates and expo just because it happens to fall in order. So I'm gonna assign this to a switch, switch F. And you see, I highlight that and then I just move the switch and it assigns it. So like if I highlight this and I put it to switch D, it'll automatically assign that to D, okay? Now keep in mind, if D is already doing something in terms of controlling a channel, it will control a channel. But this expo in dual rates is controlling the way that we interact with the channel. So it's all handled here. But if you're handling a channel output, the handle, you're handling up here in the plane. Expo in dual rates is handled here before it sends the signal out to what the plane is to do, okay? So that's a local control. So I'm gonna go ahead and highlight that again, put it back to switch D, or excuse me, switch F, which is over here. Hopefully that didn't confuse you too much, just trying to teach you a little something. Okay, so uh, we do a lot of education on this channel, and that's one of the big reasons why we do long videos is because it takes a lot of information to get people up in the air. And trust me, you're gonna be able to do this in five minutes once you're an expert. All right, so then we can switch from the ailerons. So there's three axes of control, elevator, rudder, and ailerons. Okay. Elevator. And I say primary control surfaces, I should say, because there's always gonna be secondary control surfaces um, that you can, you can impact your flight performance, but it may not actually impact the directly the yaw pitch or roll of the craft. Okay, so why do I do this? I do the same thing on all three of the controls. So I'll show you on the last one, which is rudder. Make the assignment to switch F. On the zero position, the upward position, you can see that little zero there, one and two, zero, one and two, zero, one and two, zero, one and two. We start in the middle, okay? So zero is gonna be 5% expo. 
the middle, which is where we're gonna fly from default when we take off. And then the top setting is 20, but we also lower the rate. And you're like, well, what are the, what is the rate and what is the expo? Expo, this is the curve. So if you look at the curve, this is the rudder stick. So if I move the stick a little bit, it tells you what the position is. So you see at the bottom how it says 15 equals nine. 15 equals 10, 17 equals 11. But then up here, it gets closer and closer to full output. You see how it's like 89 equals, okay. But there's 100 equals 90. So at 100% stick output, you have 90. At 100% stick output, you have 90. That's what the rate does. Now the expo changes this into a curve. So at the first, approximately 20%, you're gonna have a small change in de degradation, degradation in output. So if I move this in the first 20% or so, you see I'm giving it 20 and it's only 12. That's eight off at 20. That's not 90%, okay? So it's gonna, it's gonna catch up with itself at the end of the curve, right? So now let's show you what it looks like in the normal flying mode. That's where I'm gonna start, 100%. So when you move the stick all the way, you get all the way. When you move the stick all the way, you get all the way. When you move the stick a little bit, you have a little bit of deterioration so you give it like 15, you only get 13. You give it 30, you're almost caught up. You give it 50, you're pretty dang close. You give it 60, 70, see how close it is? And then all of a sudden you get toward the end of the range and you're pretty much caught up, okay? So that's called Expo. And that Expo is exponentially changing the output by 10%. Now you're thinking to yourself, why the heck do I need to do that, Brian? Just trust me, if you do this, your plane's gonna be touchy. If you do this, it's gonna be softer. It's gonna be weird because you're like moving the sticks, but it feels just like, you know, you're a better pilot. And if you do that, it's just gonna be super spongy and super relaxed. And you can pull that stick too far and it won't overcorrect and this sort of thing. And you know, this will make you yaw, but it's not gonna be as jerky. And this is gonna make you roll, but it's like, you don't have to be quite as finite because remember you're controlling two channels here. So most people's thumbs, like this is throttle, okay, throttle cuts on, we don't have the plane energized, so we're safe. So we move the throttle stick up, you see what's happening to the rudder? The rudder moves a little bit. I'm being careful, so you know, a lot of guys will do use a ton of expo on rudder. So then you have to be very distinct about giving rudder input so you don't screw up. And then you can screw up your throttle too. Now some guys do it like this, they do pincer grip. I don't like pincer grip, that's not what I do, I never have, I'm not gonna even try. Okay, so this is just a different style. I use thumbs, that's, I think that's the way a lot of people do it, but some people like to use pincer grip. I don't like that. And you usually say that newer pilots tend to over control. Yes. Like when I'm flying, I'm like all the way back, all the way over. Like you just yeah, don't have as much are, finite. These are proportional. And mm -hmm. when I'm flying, I'm, I'm moving in terms of percentages. And when Megan flies, it's like per terms of <laughs> yes. what direction do I not crash, crash, no, no, crash, no, yes. yes. So that's the way a beginner pilot tends to fly. And that's okay. It's not to diminish her skill or quality of piloting or anything like that. I mean, she's just new. So when you're new, you're gonna suck too. Don't worry, it's just the way everybody starts. Everybody sucks, I sucked, you suck, everybody sucks. It's just a huge suck fest. But the thing is, when you get a little bit more experienced, then you'll learn, oh, I don't need to move the stick all the way over to make the plane move one degree. Cause you know, you're like, why would I do that? When it's like driving a rate of control car, the same is true. You don't always wanna go all the way. That's why proportional controls are better. And on this, we have, eight proportional controls. And there's um, additional telemetry channels as well, but you don't get access to those within an NX-8, okay? So anyway, take my word for it, just do this and then see what the difference feels like. Now, what you do is you fly, then you, you say, oh my goodness, I, it's way too touchy. Okay, that's so much better. Let me get to the ground and I'm gonna set my middle to that. That's gonna be, become my new middle. Okay, so then you go back to this setting and we just did this on a plane the other day. You'll set that to 20, You'll set this to 90, then you'll double this up, and you'll set this to like 40, and then you'll set this to maybe like, you know, 75, okay? And then you'll set this to like 10, okay? Because you're never gonna want less. So now we've made the new middle the original top, mm -hmm. right? Now you could do the same thing. Let's say that, uh, let's, uh, let's set this back to normal. So the normal's like this and this, and then this is gonna be all the way at 100, and then this is gonna be, and yes, you can do negative expo, and then this is gonna be that. Okay, so let's say that you're flying along, you're like, man, it's way too spongy, I need more tightness, so you go like that. Well, you make that your new middle. Well, guess what, then this becomes five, and guess what you gotta do, then this becomes, you know, like two or zero, and then this becomes, 
you know, 10, and then you just like open that range all the way up to 100, okay? Now you can also have extra output here too, but generally speaking, you would do that in your radio setup in the, you know, the servos in my opinion. But you can make the expo negative as well, and that would be more for, in my case, I'm gonna set it back to the normal now. In that case, you would do that for like a 3D flying plane where you got a hammerhead where you're trying to be, you know, like vertical and you got lots of minor corrections and things like this as a pilot, okay? So now, we've probably confused you a little bit, so I'm just gonna go back through. The ailerons, those are the three settings, okay? And you do that the same for all three. Aileron, elevator, and rudder. See how that works? And you start in the middle and you'll be able to adjust from there. Just take my word for it, you need to practice with it. And by the way, it's highly subjective. You may not like it, and if you don't like it, you don't have to do any of the stuff we do, except for maybe throttle cut. You definitely need to do throttle cut because it's a safety thing. And if we make changes after the maiden, we and show you it. show that. So if you watch the maiden and you set it, and then you go back and you're building along with us, and you're like, wait, his expo is different. Go with whatever Brian says in, in the, the maiden. maiden. Yes. Because we make adjustments, and we will put out the video for this, uh, you know, one minute before the maiden. So you may actually see the maiden first, and then come back and watch the radio setup because you say, you know, I, I must have the Technum 2010. It, that thing looks perfect for me. It's beautiful. It's tricycle. Tricycle is, you know, that's that's a tail dragger. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is, and, and they also offer a Husky Ultimate. It's real similar to that. It's a little bit bigger than that. Uh, they have a Husky and a Husky Ultimate. The Husky Ultimate success. Okay. This one here is flying on three S, so it's a lot less power. That's half as much voltage, uh, which means it's just. By the way, just because there's more voltage doesn't mean it's faster. It can mean it's faster, but generally it just means it's bigger in the aircraft world. Now in a car world, you know, it's like that success is gonna be really fast. Um, and that just speaks to the number of cells in series as in S, not cell as in C. <laughs> but C rate has to do with both the speed with which you charge through this and then balance through this balances the cells that are in series. Confused yet? <laughs> and then the C rating, also C rating, speaks to the discharge rate out this only. And then sometimes we'll hook up like a voltage alarm here. And it will alarm if one of the cells or two of the cells or three of the cells are sagging. Because you can have one cell that sags and then that will undermine your ability to achieve the nominal voltage within a series of cells. So you can monitor that. Now the smart batteries do all that internally and then they have an extra data pin that comes out the middle and it's a different type of connector here. We'll get into more detail on that on another video. But if you're curious about it, you can check out our smart technology in the playlists. Now that's what's so nice about Brian Phillips RC is that if you're new to this and you're like, oh my goodness, Brian, you've explained so many things that I was confused about there's so much more. Trust me, we have thousands of videos. I am not exaggerating, mm -hmm. okay? So we're gonna open this thing up now that we have, oh, actually we're not quite done, let's keep going down the list. So throttle cut, so we were done with DR, dual rates and expo. Then we're gonna scroll down to throttle cut. So it says inhibit, I'm gonna turn that on. Inhibit just means it's off. Switch H, okay, so you see how this is moving up and down, that's our throt throttle, now it's on. See how it's at minus 100 no matter what the stick condition's in. Now, when I turn the throttle cut off, it's allowed to give throttle, okay? So throttle cuts on, that's a safety feature. Why does that matter? Because when this spins really fast and you have your arm here, you are gonna go to the hospital and you're gonna be cut all the way down to your tendons or bone, and it's gonna be disgusting and you have blood on your ceiling. Ew. You're gonna have blood on the walls. You're gonna have blood on your camera crew or your kids or whoever's standing around and it's gonna be disgusting and you're probably gonna not be able to fly for months and you could die if you're really stupid. So you need to seriously take this serious. What most new pilots do is they wait to install the prop until they're completely done. I will show you some safeguards that we follow, but it's always up to you. I cannot be safe for you in a video, but I also don't wanna be a nanny because we're all grown men here watching this, except for the women and the children. So most of you that are watching right now are grown men. Yes. And then the women and children that are also watching, I don't mean to, 
I, I'm not really worried about you guys cutting yourself. I'm just the gross man that I'm the growth, the grown man that I'm the worried about. Man. The ones that ex that ignore the instructions yes, like I would. That didn't open okay. Directions. All right, so throttle cuts on, throttle curve we don't mess with. That's like a helicopter thing. Analog switch setup we're not going to mess with. Digital switch setup we're not going to mess with. Uh, actually, we will later. Flap system we are going to set. Okay, I like it on switch B. You notice how sometimes like when you're assigning it, it will accidentally bump. You know this. Don't worry about it. Just put it to one you want. And the last one you pick, you accept it by clicking it again. I'm gonna set the speed to two seconds. That speaks to how fast the deployment is. And you're like, I don't even know what flaps are, let alone deployment. Don't worry, we'll get there. Okay, so just take my word for this. 100 and minus 100. And you're like, this is so weird, Brian. What the heck does all this crap mean? Don't worry, we'll get there. I'm just gonna show you and then I'll talk about it. Okay, so six and let's do 10. Okay, right, real quick, so you have a positions. It says position zero, one, two, what does that mean? That speaks to this switch, B, which is this one. A is up here, throttle cuts over here. This one we're not using, that's called G. You can tell because it's labeled right here. This is the right knob, we're not gonna mess with that. This is the bind button, okay? So up here it just says B, see, we're in agreement. There's switch zero, one, and two. So I typically fly with my switches like this at the beginning of a flight. F is in neutral, the middle. H is toward my belly, which is throttle cut. I've found that to be the safest way to do it. If it's out here, it's too easy to bump it off. I would rather have to pull it on. Now you can still accidentally pull it on, but I'd rather have it on when I don't want it on than have it off when I want it on because that's how you end up at the hospital. Right, if somebody goes and picks up your transmitter for you, it's more likely that they're gonna or when you're hanging from a lanyard and you go to pick up your plane, right. it will get hit. And I promise you, you will hit your throttle and you will have an oopsie-kins at some point. Okay, I've cut myself on props. Not very often and it's not like a big thing and I was fortunate it was small planes, but I have cut myself with props. And people that get cut by props usually end up in the hospital. Okay, so I've been fortunate. And I handle a lot of planes, okay? So throttle cuts on. We have assigned this to over here. Now, I keep switch A for retracts. I use this for flaps. And I use this for safe, off, AS3X, or vice versa, AS3X, off, and safe. Except this doesn't have safe. Safe is called sensor aided flight envelope. AS3X is artificial stabilization three axis, which is spectrum gear. If you were to use the spectrum offering for a stabilizer that's built in, you would have safe and AS3X. This has, instead of safe and AS3X, it has the vector, which is an external stabilizer that works after the reception of the input from your controller. And then it intercepts that and it does the fancy work for the stabilization and the gyro and all that good stuff, okay? And then it also auto levels the plane. So this does not have to be spatially aware as would an AS3X or safe equipped receiver. So this should just flop around in there. Whereas the vector has to be spatially aware so that it can restore the plane to a level condition, level attitude, level roll. It doesn't control yaw, okay? So that does need to be spatially aware. This doesn't have to be. So just a few things for you to understand and keep in mind. All right, so now continuing on. So we were gonna talk about flaps, but we haven't yet. Now, what does that mean? That means on an, a Spectrum radio system, they classify three different positions. So flaps are all the way up, then they're neutral, or excuse me, that's the neutral, sort of the center of the switch, and then that's toward my belly. Okay, so away from my belly. Imagine that was the flap. So it's actuating, and then it's actuating some more, okay? Then it's actuating back, and it takes two seconds to do it. That's what this stands for. This is the assignment for switch. And then this is what each position calls for. Now you may wanna have a little bit more, a little bit less, and we'll talk about that more when it's actually started. Now, what does elevator mean? Elevator is a correction factor where the elevator, watch this, it moves by a factor of six at full one position and a factor of 10 at full two position. So it's 10 based on also whatever you're doing with the sticks. So what happens is the two second deployment will bring the flaps to a position and then bring them down further when you go to the landing setting. 
and the elevator will correspondingly do the same. You can also have it do opposite if you do a negative value here. The reason you do that is because when you put down flaps on a plane like this, it's going to balloon. It's going to go flying in a straight line, same speed, nothing else changes, nice level flight. You put down the flaps, it's going to go, it's going to start to balloon. The elevator corrects and guess what happens to your airspeed? What happens, camera crew? You, your airspeed slows down, but your... Your, no. your airspeed slows down. Yes. Because the plane tends to pitch up and balloon and then we correct with the elevator. And, and so instead of going, let's say you're going 40 miles an hour, it starts to balloon. And obviously if you balloon, you, nothing else changes. You're gonna tend to slow down a little bit anyway. But then your elevator corrects, get you into that level attitude, you keep flying level, you're gonna be going like 20, 30% slower. It's a huge difference. But you're not gonna be stalling, crashing, falling out of the sky because you produce a different or more lift because the shape of the wing has changed. That's what a flap does. The inboard flaps are what's changing. The outboard ailerons are what roll the plane and they continue to command and control the roll authority of the plane while the flaps are doing whatever the flaps do. You're essentially changing your wing to suit your flying needs. So now you usually use flaps when you're taking off because you're not going, you're going zero miles an hour and you want to get in the air, right? How do you do it? You apply throttle and you start rolling forward. Well, if you have to roll to 120 miles an hour on a real plane to get off the ground, well, you want to reduce that because like that's really hard on your landing gear. Same is true on these. So the bogeys get bent, you know, you hit rocks and crap and these things happen. You're more vulnerable on takeoff and landing in a real plane. So you want to slow down the speed that you can break the surface tension and all the friction and heat and everything that builds up in the tires in real airplanes. And so what we do is we change the wing so that it's down part of the way or half flap setting or third, whatever it happens to be take off flap setting. So you got takeoff flaps and then you go and you could take off at a lower speed. Okay, so that's great, it's good for everybody. Now when you're getting into final, you usually roll in your takeoff flaps and you'll get into final, usually turning, you kind of get into a circuit, you're, you're closing out the circuit, you're running, running that way to, to land. You put your landing flaps all the way down and you're slowing down, right? You're slowing down, the whole time you're slowing down. Well, you don't wanna have flaps way down when you're taking off because you're gonna create a ton of drag. So you have to overwhelm all that drag. Now you may take off with landing flaps if you're in tall grass, you wanna get off the ground really quick, We'll talk about that in the flight part. But the idea is you want a couple of different settings so you can quickly ask for and quickly get what you need so you can make changes to your flight arrangement, okay? So that's what takeoff and landing flaps are. Well, why plus 100, minus 100, and zero and all this crap, Brian? That doesn't make sense. Yes, it does. A servo spins like this. Say this is the body of the servo. There's half, there's the other half, okay? This is minus 100, this is zero. This is plus 100, that's all it is. You can actually overdrive servos to 150% most of the time, okay? 150% 100, plus, 150% minus. And spectrum speaks to it in terms of plus or minus percentages, okay? But other brands speak to it as in terms of like 100% and zero. Okay, so that's just the way Spectrum does it. I don't know how Futaba does it. I don't even use Futaba, okay? So now that we've got that out of the way, also FR Sky, same thing, they do things different. Open TX, you know, all these different protocols, which are actually the way that the radios talk to one another, have different structure for setup. That's why we like Spectrum, because it holds true from early versions all the way to where we are now, and that's why we like them so much. Okay. So getting back to the point. So we've talked a little bit about the flaps. That is a very entry level approach. Okay, so there's other things that happen during flap deployment. When the flaps are down, landing flaps are down, the plane will have more drag. And what does a wing do? It produces lift and it creates drag, okay? So the thicker the wing cord, the more lift it creates, but the more drag it also creates. So drag requires more power to offset the drag coefficient. So as you're flying, you need to go faster to produce, or you have to have more power, not necessarily more speed, to produce the same amount of lift, right? So more power to offset the drag. Imagine a flat plane, like a piece of paper that's really stiff. And you're going like this, and you're like, what is that doing? It's just creating drag, right? It's not really producing lift. Now imagine the airfoil shape that we're used to seeing. 
Okay, and I don't want to get into some technology, you know, argument over, you know, you could use a flat plane. I get it. I, I'm with you. But anyway, just suppose it's shaped like the wing, right? The bigger, the bigger that airfoil shape, the more lift you're going to create, but at the same time, the more drag. When you put those flaps all the way down, and then you have elevator correction that keeps you pointed where you are, you can also change the attitude of the aircraft. So where you point. Because in a real aircraft, when you're coming into land, you've got a nose in, in front of you, right? Where are you landing? You're landing down there, right there. Okay, so if you're landing down there and you're sitting right here, how do you see? You can't see over the engine. You know, you can't see over the, yeah, I mean, you can see through the prop because it's passing by quickly, but it's really hard to see. So what do you do? You point the plane down, right? Because you don't, you don't want to keep flying at 2,000 feet or 5,000 or 7,000 feet or, or 7,500 or 2,500 or 3,500 or whatever it is. So you're just going this way, you're going on one axis, you're going this way, you're going at 500 splits. So they're going to bring you down like this. So you have to, you have to point at the runway. Well, how are you going to point downhill and slow down? You're in an airplane, you know, you point downhill, what happens, camera crew? You crash. No, you go, you go faster. faster. <laughs> you pick up speed. So what do you do to stop picking up speed? You, you don't put the brakes on on the wheels. The wheels are part of the plane, right? Yeah. So you have to change the shape of the wing or you have to just shut off the prop or lower the throttle and then eventually, and by the way, there is prop generated or there is drag generated by the prop too, a, a lot. And there is a point where you're pulling the plane and then there's a point where you're creating drag and then there is completely off. And that's actually the most efficient for the flight performance of the plane but it's not necessarily gonna do much for slowing you down. You can actually tractor the prop where you're giving almost no power and you slow the plane down with the spin of the prop because instead of looking at a prop that's sitting still, creating very limited drag, you're looking at a plane that's considered to be round the size of the prop like this. Imagine if you cut out a sheet of paper and you mounted it right there, how much drag you would create. It's a tremendous amount of drag. Same is true on all prop planes. So if you tractor the prop, and this happens to be a tractor prop that's pulling the plane, but it's a different terminology here. If you tractor the prop, you just let it be dragged through the air, then it will actually slow the plane down. Now, if you have braking on, it will stop the prop. And so we do that on sailplanes so that we don't create that same drag. Okay, getting into the weeds here. Sorry, <laughs> I know it's a lot of information, but a beginner plane calls for a lot of answers. All right, so we have flap system set up, and we want to set up a timer. Now, did they talk about the timer in the book? They do not. Okay, if they don't talk about the timer, then we'll just set it. So we have five minutes, that's good enough. Active, one time. If I go over 25%, it's gonna start the timer for five minutes. And you're like, well, what happens at the end of five minutes? Does everybody just like die? No, hopefully not. Voice, I want a one minute warning. She's gonna one minute remaining. Okay, then you're gonna go to 20 seconds, I don't care. 10 seconds, I want a countdown. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Yeah, it's just like that. Tone and vibrate at expiration and then a tone every minute thereafter. So the only drawback of the way, see it started, it started, you can hit cancel. Okay. Start it, it starts counting down. Cancel. And you're like, but Brian, you're not going to necessarily be in the throttle all the time. You're flying an airplane, my friend. If you're not in throttle, you're not going to be flying very long. Yes, you're going to be in and out of throttle. You're going to change the position a lot. And yeah, you could hypothetically have like an amplitude calibration and you could say like, oh, at this, at certain angles of attack, we would draw this many milliamps per rate of change, blah. Oh, and you could goodness. do math, but people are never going to do that crap. No. So. I'm just gonna clear this. That's a simple tool used for simple reasons and you'll be surprised how accurate it is despite its simplicity, yeah. okay? I, complexity is the enemy of reliability. Okay, coming forward. So now we have this transmitter and receiver and we have to plug things in. Throttle, aileron, elevator, rudder, gear, flap, auxiliary two, auxiliary three. Oh, real quick, I wanna go back into this, see this? When I move that, it moves auxiliary two as well. Channel one, two, three, four, five, six. It doesn't even matter because that's channel seven, but if you had an eight channel receiver, you would need to eliminate that. So if you go to system setup, you disconnect RF. See? You, you're basically confirming that you're okay disconnecting RF. 
Then you can go down to channel assign and you see how this says aux 2 B? You could just go to something else or you can inhibit. Now watch this. Now it doesn't change auxiliary two. Okay. Not that it matters on this particular plane because we only have six pluggable channels here. Now some of the spectrum receivers have additional channels that ride above or below, well above in this case, the channel of pluggable plugs. So like on the AR637 for instance, which has ASRX and SAFE, there's additional channels above for gain and modes, okay? So you can actually command and control all the channels with an NX8. For an 8230, which would be like the big brother with two additional pluggable channels, there's two more still. So you'd have to have the NX10 to get into those top two channels. Now, we recommend the NX8, not the NX6. The NX6 has technically a seventh half channel so that you can turn modes on and off. If you're like me, and you're this far into a plane, and you're excited about getting where you want to get, get the NX-8. It's not that much more money. It's a better value. You are going to get more time and traction out of it. If you want to help support our channel, and you're buying this plane through the links, which you can right now, follow the links in the video description below. You can also buy this. You can also buy the battery. We'll link to the battery. We'll link to the receiver. You can buy all three of these things in one pop. You can buy this from our links. That one is a perfectly fine one. If you want to line my pockets with extra commission and waste a lot of money, you can drop 500 bucks extra and buy that. And then later you can buy this when you find out I was right. Or you can take my word for it. You can also save yourself even more and get an NX-10 because an NX-10 is going to buy you even more time. Now, if you ask me, can I get the DX-3E? <laughs> no. First of all, that's three channel. It doesn't <laughs> exist. But I, I was exaggerating. There is an nx line that's the current line then there's the dx which was before i have a dx 18 a very expensive like a 2000 r transmitter that i still have and i never use it because all the current stuff is on here although i do have the firmware updated on the dx 18 and it works fully fine it's just kind of slow and i have no interest in using it because the nx8 works so much better so the nx8 is fine it's going to buy you two or three years conservatively because everything that has come out from there till now and i mean everything because we do everything those have all been covered and I've had two planes that we ran out of channels on and mm -hmm. they were plug and flies and we were doing sophisticated things like flapperons and crow. Okay. So we were using extra channels that you wouldn't necessarily have to do. Okay. All right. So that being said, NX8 is the way to go. Yes, we do have a more expensive battery in here, which is right there. It's a 3.7 volt, just like the other one, but this is 6,000 milliamp hour instead of the 2000 that comes, it's just one cell instead of three. The three cells will get you a lot of use before you have to charge. I charge about once every two weeks and we do a lot of footage, okay? So if you're a normal flyer and you're just going out for the evening, you wanna fly, plus you've got your plug on the back so you can just plug it in and charge it in the car if you want. Just keep in mind, when your charger's out, you are not flying. So it's kind of an expensive battery, but you may wanna think about it, okay? Did we clear that up? Was that good? Yes. Okay. So tell your wife, Brian's wife says, Get an just get the better just one. Just get the better just, one. This is the one area where I'm going to say, don't cheap out, okay? No. And I'm a cheapskate. I get it. I am saying, be cheap and buy the right one. Yeah. This is one of those times. Now, if you want to be really cheap and buy open TX and all that crap, have at it. But guess what? You're going to be buying this anyway because you're going to get frustrated. And if you're a new pilot, it is way over my head pretty much setting all that junk up. And I have tried. I have open TX transmitters. I have the TX uh, 8G16T, whatever it is. I don't even know what the model number is. It's stupid model numbers. And uh, I've had nothing but problems getting it to bind to all these little, you know, mm -hmm. um, toy grad e sheens, which by the way are super fun, but just get them in there ready to fly and be done with it. It's not that big a deal. You're not going to be there forever. If you're there forever, you just advance to the next plane, please. Okay. You don't know what you're missing. If that's all you've done, it's awesome, it's super fun, entry level stuff, but this is gonna be like night and day difference. Seriously, even if you love the P40, you're gonna love this more, I promise, okay? I'm not just blowing smoke, this is because personal experience, folks. Okay, getting back to the point, lots of talk today, throttle. So we're gonna look at this. This thing has labels on it, and it says BAT, then one, two, three, four, five, six, and as you can see somewhere on here, it's gonna label what the pinout is, does it? Holy cow, it doesn't even label it. Are you kidding me? What the heck? Oh yeah, it does. It's super faint. Oh my goodness, you can barely see it. Minus plus signal, 
Okay, signal's up here. So just figure on signal's this side. What color is signal? The lighter color, because there's orange, red, and brown, or there's white, red, and black, okay? So that's throttle, so it goes into the second plug, which is port one. And you're like, well, why is there, why is there even a, what is the bat plug supposed to mean? The bat plug, oh, hold on a sec. Oh, we don't have a gear channel. We'll talk about gear channel later. The gear channel is already assigned by this switch, but that's gonna be our mode channel, okay guys? So just so you know. Okay, so throttle, then the next one's aileron. How do you know that's the next one? Because I'm just looking at this. It's throttle, then aileron. So it's just, that's why we did our radio setup first. There's ailerons. Okay, so remember, this just goes into our receiver, or technically out of our receiver into the stabilizer. The stabilizer also does the auto leveling, so don't, don't fret if you're a new pilot and that's what you're after. You do get that with the arrows uh, vector. Okay, so that was uh, elevator. Then we need rudder. Rudder is here. And I'm just untangling the cables as we go because these things will be very tingly nightmares if you're not careful. And by the way, just wanted to say, Hobbyzone.com, uh, the people we work with on this plane have been super, super good to work with. They're a great family-owned company. And um, they have an amazing reputation for backing up their products, for better or for worse. That's one of the reasons why we love working with them. One of the criteria we give for work, this says S-Bus PPM mode. So if you were doing, if you were doing S-Bus, like through Futaba, then you would go through here. S bus stands for serial bus. PPM stands for pulse width modulation, but I, I forget what the PPM stands for. And that would actually go in to that plug and you'd only have one wire. It would do all the stuff, okay? That's another way of doing it. You do a satellite receiver. Okay, so this is channel six, flaps. You're like, but Brian, that didn't go out to the, Stabilizer, yeah, that's right, because this isn't a stabilized channel. Okay, so then you can you can just find a spot where this fits, and I'm gonna turn it so that the, this is a little bind button, okay? And we'll be prepared. It looks like it'll fit right here if we just kind of cram it in there. Oh yeah, yeah, it works, works great, okay. So now, let's talk about safety for a minute. Throttle cuts on, sticks all the way down. We're gonna clear the timer just for convenience sake. I'm gonna leave this in a place where I can reach it. I'm gonna establish a safe area for the prop to spin. Then I'm gonna hold the plane. Then I'm gonna say, will I get cut? Will I end up in the ER if I do anything right now? No, I think I'm fine. Also, we didn't talk about Velcro. Let's talk about Velcro for a minute. Oh, okay. If you're using Velcro on your batteries, good on you, that's fine. I hate it, I already have it on this battery, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna peel off and figure out which one goes in the plane. This is the harder, this is the softer hook and loop. The softer happens to already be on that battery, so I'm gonna go with the harder in the plane. Then there's these Velcro straps, which also hold it down. Then there's a steerable nose gear under there, and you're like, oh crap, how am I gonna make this work? Because obviously I wanna be able to get to where the battery is, okay? So you don't wanna cover that up, so I'm just gonna like literally just cut off part of this and keep about half of it, and then the other half I'm gonna stick down in there because there's no reason to use that whole thing. You're not ever gonna have the battery that far off. And that being said, on these beginner planes, they usually go right between the straps most of the time. Uh, so I'm just gonna plop this on here. I do find it strange that they don't install it for us on this. Generally, they would be installed. But there are certain features that certain planes have and other planes don't, and it just makes you wonder, like, why did they decide to not do that on this plane? It's just kind of unusual. But it, it's not really a big problem. Just weird. That is some good sticky stuff. Oh my goodness. Did you feel how it I heard was it. like picking up the plane? This I didn't get lined up very good. See how it's coming up? If you're gonna change it, you better change it right now. It ain't gonna come up after a couple of days. Okay, so now that we have that, look, I have Velcro right in the absent part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ironic. Okay, so there's one spot, there's the other spot, and guess what, we miss, okay? That is why I hate Velcro on batteries because you either have it on the wrong side or you have to cover up your label so you don't know what the heck size it is and you have to always guess and you think, oh, that's 3S, but I don't remember what size it is. Oh, it's so annoying. So what I have done is I've come up with a very simple solution 
And I'm gonna show you. So this is stuck in here, everybody's happy, right? Okay, so that would definitely work if you wanted to put Velcro on your battery, you could just peel this off, stick it on, and that thing will stay in there even if these straps are absent, okay? I'm gonna give you the gear, the, 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 well, I'm not gonna give you a guarantee because anything stupid can happen. Uh, but what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you an alternative that works better and it's cheap and effective and works almost every time it's tried. Almost is a key. Okay, see, watch. Look, this would normally be stuck on the battery. Instead, I'm gonna stick it on shelf liner. Why is shelf liner so nice, camera crew? Because it's cheap and easy and it doesn't slide around. Yep. And that's all that matters in this application. So I'm just going to use up that little bit because I'm such a cheapskate. Steal it out of your wife's kitchen drawer. Yep. Or take it from her when she's throwing it away. Yeah, right. And if she's throwing it away because it's dirty and gross because it's been in there for a long time, just rinse it off with hot water and yeah. soap, dry it, and you'll be golden. Okay? Seriously. By the way, if we haven't mentioned, we do a lot of education on this channel for a reason. If you're curious, if you're new to the channel, and you're trying to figure out what Brian Phillips' RC is all about, we try to help people stop from being one and done statistics. What is a one and done? A one and done is somebody who gets into the aircraft that they shouldn't be getting into, they crash it, immediately hate the hobby, never come back, they leave, and they leave their hopes and dreams at the flying field because they made a bad decision on what to buy. And by the way, that is very common. It is very common, it is yep. very easy to do, and this is a hard hobby. It is hard to do, it is hard to get into, and if you don't have help, you're probably going to fail. Well, and there's a lot of stuff that looks really cool. And then it sucks. Or it's it's just or above it's, your skill level. Oh, it's just cheap. It's yeah. I want the cheaper one. You know, I've only got $300 this month. I, I, I really want to get this plane and it looks so good and Oh wow, look at that, look at this, look at this review video from the manufacturer. It's just perfect. It makes it look great. It's so easy. No. Wrong. Okay. I'm here to help you, okay? We want you guys to have success. I was just like you just a short eight years ago. Okay, so we get, got this on there. I took longer than normal because I was Brian Phillips story timing it. Okay, so we just stick that in there. It's easy peasy wheezy. Then we just stick the battery in. Yes, this battery is charged. Okay, now look, no straps and it barely slips, okay? Right now, all you do is you put a little pressure on it. Now, I don't even know if the CG is right. We'll talk about that, which stands for center of gravity. But at the end of the day, guys, that's one of the main things we do is we help beginner pilots get into the pilot seat. And when I say pilot seat, behind the sticks on their transmitter. And if you're just coming back to the hobby, and no, I'm not tooting my own horn, I'm serious. Go look at the comments for the last eight years and you will see thousands of people that have come back to the hobby, not because of me, because the hobby is awesome and we happen to be talking about it on YouTube. It's not because of me, it's just because they happened to stumble into this channel and probably a few other good ones. And they watched and they said, you know what? I learned a lot, I'm gonna come back. Next thing you know, they're back every time. Next thing you know, they're buying products from our links. They're helping to support our family. You know, we're finding mutual success. I'm growing in the hobby, they're growing in the hobby. We grow together. Maybe they're, you know, just new and they're kind of growing along. They're growing with us as I advance. I keep growing up these new population of RC pilots that come and uh, get some training here. We love that, that's super fun. It's what we're all about here on Brian Phillips RC. We're not about nanny state. We're not about protecting you with a lot of rules and crap that stops you from doing this. We're here to help you go from where you are now, which is not flying and wanting to, to where you wanna be, which is flying successfully to the point where you don't need us at all ever again. But then you'll come back because you're like, oh, that plane looks sweet. And then we're here to support you in that regard too because that's basically what we do. So if you're wondering why we keep saying educational, it's because of Freya. Well, and we know that everybody has a limited budget. So we want, we want you, you to, to get spend, the most out of it. Yes, if you spend 600 bucks on a plane that you can't fly for two years. Oh, or yes. you spend 600 bucks on a plane and you spend 600 bucks on a transmitter and battery pack, and then you spend 300 bucks on a dual charger, and then you spend $400 on two or three big batteries. Mm -hmm and then you crash it, you're gonna be like, I wanna to go to that hobby shop and tell that guy what I really think of him. Instead of telling him what you think of him, just think that out loud at home in front of your computer while you're watching me tell you the truth. Because at the end of the day, we stand to gain from you finding success, but only if you find success. Because if you don't find success and you're one and done, it does us no good. And we wanna grow this hobby because the more people in this hobby means the more legislative authority we'll have, meaning we can fight big government overreach, which is happening right now. 
We can also have cheaper stuff for everybody. This stuff is loaded with technology and it comes so cheap right now. Go 20 years back, you will not believe me, but go back 20 years and see what you got for 400 or 500 bucks. And I'm talking about the 400 or $500 today's money. You gotta do the conversion, you know, you made four or 500 bucks a lot quicker than you do these days. But anyway, take inflation into account and tell me what you got for four or $500 transmitter. You're getting a three channel radio with nothing. You might get one switch and that switch controls a channel too. So I'm telling you right now, we are spoiled with the tech. Okay, anyway, getting back to the point, that's what we do here on Brian Phillips RC. We've done it for literally thousands of movies, thousands of videos, feature length motion picture times two sometimes. And yes, it's long, but distinguished. So we hope you enjoy that sort of thing. And if you do enjoy that, make sure you give us a like because we get killed by stats on YouTube. YouTube has tried to destroy us from day one and you can fight back against the man by clicking the like button clicking the bell for notifications. So you get all the content we're releasing four to five times a week on some weeks. Usually we do three, sometimes a fourth on Sunday, which is a little bit off the wall. Wednesdays are vehicles, ground vehicles. Tuesdays, Monday or Tuesday, we have the second thoughts and you know, like smaller releases. And Thursday, we got like the big thing. And then sometimes we just throw out, throw out the whole week and we just have awesome things come out. So stay tuned. There's so much more to come for Brian Phillips RC. That's what you're watching right now. And if you want to see something that we did in the past, like, hey man, that red plane on the floor, what the heck is that? Hasn't released yet, sorry. How about this one? Oh yeah, we've done that. Oh, how about that one back there? Sorry, also haven't released that yet. But there's so much coming, we can even talk about it. There's boxes over here. We got about seven things coming in the mail right now. We literally can't get caught up and it's terrible, but awesome at the same time. So hopefully you'll be around for more. Also, we have www.brianphillipsrc.com where we're gonna have you up to date on the latest coupon codes. If you wanna buy this exact plane, it'll be there for you. And if you check it out, then you can follow the link. And yes, you will still be supporting us. So it's super helpful. All right, getting back to the point. So we're ready to plug this thing and bind it. What is binding, Brian? Binding is where you teach the transmitter what it's looking for. And you teach the transmitter what it's looking for and the receiver what it's looking for. So they talk together and it's an addressing process, okay? It's very easy. It sounds complicated, but it's not, okay? So I'm gonna click, go down a function list. It says bind. RF will be disconnected, yes. I'm gonna get it ready to say bind. Or you can turn it off, press this button while turning it on, that will do the same thing, okay? So I'm in a safe spot. I'm gonna be able to control and manipulate the plane. If this starts spinning the prop and I have to sit here and hold it, I will probably poop my drawers, but I will hold it until the battery dies. It will suck, okay? Never had to do it. Never had to do it. Okay, now I'm gonna press the bind button. It's flashing. I'm gonna secure the plane. I'll just come over here so you guys can watch. It times out of that bind sequence super fast. Okay, nothing happens, we're safe. Now, first thing we have to do, shut off throttle cut, make sure it doesn't start. It doesn't, and then it does. It's blowing air the right direction, throttle sticks down, throttle cuts on, throttle cut is tested. I will say that over and over again during radio setup, that's the way I protect myself. It's not to annoy the heck out of you, but you should start that habit and annoy your friends too. All right, so next thing we gotta do is turn the plane away from us. Why are we turning it away from you, Brian? We had an awesome view of it. Well, I understand, but we wanna see what's going on back here, not what's going on up there. Also, we have the battery in it. We're gonna assume that's at the correct position. It may not be, we'll find out in a few moments. Elevator up, elevator down. What's going on? Oh, no. It's not moving. Okay, let's check ailerons. Wrong way, wrong way. Why is that wrong? When I move this way, that thing would make the plane go this way, which is backward, okay? So, elevator we can't test yet, rudder. Ooh, that's the right way. And that's the right way on the nose gear too. You gotta check both, correct, correct. Now, flaps are obviously in landing mode. That's correct for takeoff, and that's correct for normal. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna go into servo setup, and we're just gonna reverse gear, or excuse me, not gear. We're gonna reverse ailerons. Correct, correct. And then we wanna reverse flaps, okay? So now we're in takeoff, or regular mode, then takeoff, then landing, okay? Now what we need to do is we need to throttle cut, 
verify it's on, it is on. We need to see what the elevator is doing, but in order to put the elevator in, we have to grab that little control linkage and actually hook it up. Now, why do we have to put a control linkage on the elevator, camera crew? Well, to make it work. Because the tail was not attached to mm -hmm. the fuse when we got it, okay? So we have to actually install it, and we've got some more small things to do. I don't even really care what direction it's going yet, but we have to confirm one thing before we can do this. We have to make sure we're not in auto leveling, because if we're not auto leveling, the plane might be trying to level itself or level itself. So if the elevator's up or down, I don't want to put that as the neutral position. So we have to now check gear switch because gear channel A, or excuse me, gear, which is on switch A, is being controlled channel five, in this case, is plugged in and that's our mode, okay? I can't hear any change of state. Let's go over to the mode or to the monitor. Yep, it's definitely changing. Now, if you were to look inside of here, you would see a change in state on the light for the reflex, which just for grins and giggles, let's show you what that looks like. See how it's flashing? See how it's flashing, flash, 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 flash. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now watch, watch your hand in case that prop. Mm -hmm. See how it changed? See how it goes back? Now mm -hmm. stay right there. See how it changed? Change back. Okay, so there's two modes that we're gonna be controlling if we're using the gear switch. So I want it to be stabilizer on, auto leveling on. But with the vector, you can also have off. So there's actually a possibility of on with stabilizer, off, and auto leveling with stabilizer, okay? You can't have auto leveling without stabilizer, just so you know. You can with AS3X and safe, but not on vector. That's pretty standard operating procedure, by the way. AS3X is unique in that you can have both if you want. Okay, so up, that is definitely auto leveling. How do I know? Put it on its belly, see what happens. It's trying to find the quickest route to level. The elevator would move, but it's not hooked up, okay? Quickest route to level, shut it off. Now you have stabilization, meaning it responds to input. So show the people, when I push this, that thing goes down. See how it goes down? Now I'm gonna push it up quick and watch it. It's gonna go up, up. Now, down, same thing here, up, down. Now elevator, I can't test yet because it's too hard to see, but rudder, same thing, rudder, rudder. I'm watching down the length of the plane, I found a fixed spot and I move it. Yep, it goes the direction I'm moving. Meaning that the control surface resists the impact of environment. In this case, I'm simulating a large gust of wind or a giant. A giant. So elevator, elevator's moving, when I move the stick, but it's not moving the control surface, so we need to hook that up. The way we do, uh, do we wanna, you know what? Let's just, for easiness. Plane stand it? Plane stand it. Okay. So we'll put this on the plane stand. Those lights are pretty good and bright. They're mm -hmm. not the brightest LEDs we've ever seen, and the antenna really look nice on this plane. So the Technum, she's counting down my timer. Again, I don't really care about the timer right now, so I just cleared it. All right, so if you come over here, we know we're not in auto leveling because the ailerons would be jumping. They'd be all the way locked. And as you'd pass by the level mode, it would change directions. That's a very good way to see if you're in auto leveling. Also in the manual, it tells you where to put this, okay? So if you look in the manual, it's gonna tell you somewhere to put it in probably the outside hole. Mm -hmm. So the rudder into the elevator control horn. They show it in the outside hole here, but always double check if they have another map okay. that indicates it. So elevator is supposed to be outside hole to outside hole, okay? So outside hole to outside hole means it goes into the outside hole here, outside hole there, and you have to center it, okay? So I'm gonna put that in there, and then this needs to be centered. So you see how if I were to plug that in right now, it'd be like this, you don't want that. You want it to be neutral with this surface. So that's neutral, that's up, that's down, right? So now we have to grab this with two fingers and a thumb and spin it, spin it, spin it, spin it, spin it. And this is called a clevis. That's gonna go into the control horn. I think I got it. Now I can just take that little doohickey and snap it in. Did you show them from above? Remember, these are new people. See that, how it goes through? Then it just snaps in. Look at the side. We went, we went too far. We gotta go back on a turn, oh, half a turn. just a little bit. Yep. Okay. Sorry, I'm kind of not using my thumbnail because I damaged my thumb the other day, like I said. Normally, I would be able to do that a lot easier with my thumb. 
Okay, I'm gonna go out now. Two fingers and a thumb, hard. Might need to use needle nose pliers. Okay, now I'm not gonna snap it. Yep, that's gonna pull it up too much. I gotta go another half a turn. So another half a turn's like that. Okay, just slip it through. That's probably about right. Okay, we're just a little bit past center. We snap that and then we just pull this little keeper back. That's just a little bit of fuel hose. And it seems really, it's really picky. Too. But the more little, the more little details you do like this now, the less you have to trim out in the field or adjust later. And so, you don't want to have to adjust it in the field. It's always harder to do it in the field. Mm -hmm. Unless you're building it at the field and then who cares, right? And you're doing it somewhere. Okay, so now looking at the elevator, wrong. So click, go to servo setup, click travel, scroll over to reverse and then go to elevator. Okay, now we're gonna check up, down. Roll left, roll right, yaw left, yaw right. And just imagine what the plane was doing. If it was going straight and you move this that way, what's gonna happen? The plane is gonna wanna curve this way, okay? On a flat axis, that's a yaw axis. Same thing here, it's gonna wanna yaw that way. Same thing here, if it's going straight and level and you pull back on that, it's gonna go whoosh, up in the air. When you push down, it's gonna go down. When you, when you use this, it's gonna roll until you let go and then it's gonna roll back. Now, all the controls are working, but we need to verify the control is going to work on the elevator for correction. So look at the elevator. I'm gonna raise it up quick, up, down. I have to look closely at this to see you guys made too. Come close, show them this. You're gonna to have to pan fast, you ready? Up, down, up, down. You see how it goes down when it goes down, it goes up when it goes up. So when I go up, this is gonna So I'm gonna go quick, you ready? Mm -hmm. See it? Are you getting it or not? I think so. It's okay. very hard to see on camera. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna try this. It's always really hard to actually show this because I'm having to move the plane and hold the plane at the same time. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm focusing on this. I'm gonna end up dropping it. That's what I'm gonna do. So these ailerons are super easy to check because as I lift, when I lift, instead of being flush, it's gonna go up. See how it goes up, then it goes down, then it goes up, then it goes down. It's real subtle, but that's the difference. Now elevator, I'm gonna go up, see how it goes up, and then when I go down, it goes down. When I go up, it goes up, when I go down, it goes down. It's very hard to film this. Okay, now watch the rudder. Watch where it's lined up with that reference screw hole. Now when I go right, it goes right. When I go left, it goes left. See how it covers up the screw hole? Now when I stop, it goes center. When I go left, it, it swings over to the left. We got it that time. Okay. Sorry, that's really hard to film folks, but when you're a new pilot, you need to know this. This is 100% critical. You're like, Brian, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm good at this. I've, I've never flown before. You know, I've been flying real planes for 30 years. Okay, congratulations. You'll be in the one and done crowd. Seriously. So just trust me, if you're correcting in the wrong direction, real pilot, hear me, hear me straight here. If your ailerons do this, Okay, when you're already starting to roll because of environmental impact, what's gonna happen, camera crew? It exasperates. It's gonna, ex it's, gonna, it's gonna accelerate your yeah. roll that you didn't tell it to do, so you're gonna have to be like so fast on the sticks to cancel that out, and by the way, you won't. You'll crash. Because what's gonna happen is it'll take off. It, the first little instance of wind, it's gonna, it's gonna start this effect, and then the stabilizer's gonna amplify it. Mm -hmm. So you're not only gonna go like a little bit, you're gonna go all the way into a full control where you can't control it. And you will. And you can't think fast enough to figure out what's going on and then how to correct it at the same. Like, Even a skilled pilot no. is going to have a heck of a time. Yep. I have flown with ailerons controls backward, um, uh, with the stabilizer backward, but not with the aileron controls. Because once your brain is set to what direction it's going, you crash every time. I crashed a SIG Duinger 216, is it a 216? That my yeah, grandpa built. Yeah. He had probably four months of build time in this thing. And I helped him get the electronics in. This is board fast before he passed away. We used to do this together. And I crashed it in about 10 seconds into a curb in like 300 pieces. And I felt so bad. And I've done that on more than one. We did that to the Husky Ultimate, I think, is what we did. So, which you guys didn't see, thank God. But it was embarrassing. All right, so here we go. Remember, embarrassment is part of the hobby. You might as well plan on it. <laughs> okay, you see this is not lined up with that. That's another thing we're gonna fix before we get out in the field. Okay, so that looks gorgeous. A little bit much for takeoff laps. Perfect, except not quite. So 
There's two ways to fix that. You can go into servo setup, we're gonna go to travel. And you see how flaps, it goes to the bottom instead of being in the middle. See, when it's in the middle, you can control both. When it's at the top of the extreme or the bottom of the extreme, then you can only change that setting, okay? So you see where it's parked? I'm gonna click and scroll that from 100 up. Look what happens to the control surface as I scroll up. See, now we're past center. So I'm gonna go back down until it's like maybe 140. 140, okay. So now watch this, I'm gonna deploy the flaps. See how it's, at the, it's got the highlight on the top now. So 100 now, watch this. Do you hear that noise? Mm -hmm. Must be hitting on the bottom, let's check. It's hitting right there on the actual side of the oh, fuse. Oh, okay. Well, we gotta also check where the uh, linkages are because that's another place where they'll bind. Do you see? Nope, they're, they are hitting. See how it's hitting the foam? Show them the control arm hitting the foam. The control arm on the servo is hitting the foam. Oh, down here. Yep, I can see it. You see what I'm talking about there? Mm-hmm. Okay, so now, is that a big problem on a, a foam plane? Eh, it's not huge. If this was a balsa plane, we would have already burned out that servo. That's as much as it takes. It would have been burned out for sure by now. Okay, but on foam, you get a little bit of forgiveness. And ironically, I kind of like the extra deployment, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you what I would do if I wanted to leave it that way. And if I wanna leave it that way, the easiest way, the safest way to do it, get an X-Acto knife. You're gonna carve just a little bit of clearance. Okay, so X-Acto knife, be careful. Full lining flaps. I'm gonna very carefully lay this upside down on the couch so I don't break off my antennas. Okay, and then I'm just gonna brace this so it doesn't hit me. Okay, so you see this? Look how it's hitting. It's foam. You can do whatever you need to. Okay. Super, super easy. And all you pilots that are pissed at me now, trust me, I, I'm looking out for you. You've been to flight training. I'm sure you've had people correct you before. I sure as heck get it all the time. So you see this? Now look, juxtapose that clearance now to this clearance or at lack thereof. See? See how hard that was? It took one second. Now sometimes it takes a little bit more than one second to do this step. But the cool thing is now you can produce all that additional deployment of your flaps and it took you what, like 10 seconds of overall time? Mm -hmm. Now, if you're hitting the side of the fuse with your control surface, that'd be the other thing you wanna take a look at. So let's just look at that. Okay, so that one seems to be just barely, that's not even touching, but look at this one. It's just barely, 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 barely touching. Okay, so if you wanted to resolve that, you could take and cut this, but I think it's so minimal, I'm like not even worried. I don't know. Okay, we'll just take a little teeny bit just to be on the safe side. I'm afraid now that I say that, it's gonna be like the, the end of me here. So I'll actually run this into the couch, and then I'm just gonna look, was it this one? Yes. Okay, so watch what I'm gonna do with my blade. I'm gonna take my blade, and I'm gonna literally take, I'm gonna run it along the surface of the plane. Okay, that I want to cut because I want to clear this here at this angle. Show them from above if you can. So you know, instead of holding it vertical and taking off a lot of material, I'm going to take off as minimal as possible. I'm just going to take a little teeny bite right there. Okay. And we want symmetry on flaps. Symmetry on flaps is very important because they will cause you to actually make you uh, induce a yaw on your aircraft if you're not careful. So I'm just taking that very, very bottom corner. Okay, you'll be surprised how much I just took off there. Now watch what happens when I do the full flap deployment. Shouldn't touch now. Oh yeah, we're clear now. Now also, let's go from 140 all the way up to 150. Here's 150 and we're not touching. Nope. I'm gonna go to 145 just for good measure. Now, why 145 instead of 150? The reason we go to 145 instead of 150 is that we leave a little bit of room in the pulse width modulation. In my experience, the pulse width modulation, which just has to do with, that's a pulse, okay? The width modulation changes the frequency. So very fast, very wide, very slow. Okay, so wide, narrow, analog lots, analog little. That's what you're controlling. You're controlling a pulse width 
by modulating how fast or how slow it modulates up and down. That's pulse width modulation, okay? PWM, pulse width modulation. So what I found is that when you get into the top and the bottom of the ranges of that pulse width modulation, you can sometimes spill over into the next channel. I've only experienced that on Lemon RX receivers and they're probably cheating or doing some, you know, copied version of Spectrum or whatever. So I just do that as a safeguard. It's not like it's an end all cure all. You can go to 150 if you want, but I'm going to 145 just to be safe because that extra five is really only five over 300, okay? Because you have 150 plus or minus, minus five, that would be what, one and a half percent? So it's just very small amount, okay? All right, so there you go. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. So there's your takeoff flaps. And I'm actually gonna adjust that now in the flap menu, okay? So you're like, Brian, this is a lot of setup for a beginner plane. That's true, you don't have to do all this stuff, but I'm gonna do it because I want to. Probably Oops, about, timer, flap system. Probably about 10 minutes of. Flap system. Takeoff flaps are deployed. Yeah, it goes down, that goes up. See, now I can just scroll it and look where I got them. Okay, so there's takeoff. So we're about, see how it goes from 100 to 30. See how it goes from 100 to 30. And then from 30 all the way down to barn door. That's landing, that's a lot of drag. That's takeoff. Now you'll note when I'm flying, and you've already watched me fly this because this video came out and most people watch the maiden first. I fly with flaps a lot because it allows you to slow down and it buys you a lot of security, okay? It's like insurance, cheap insurance. So you will be able to reduce your stall speed without reducing your flight performance by putting on your takeoff flaps. Now, when you deploy your full landing flaps in this configuration, you're going to basically reduce your flight performance significantly because you're really getting into a landing configuration, okay? In takeoff configuration right here, you could fly the whole flight that way and you would just fly a slightly slower plane with a lot lower stall speed, okay? Now, you could also fly with no flaps and not even have them controlled, period. You can just leave them unhooked and make sure they're in the right position, but if you're not gonna, if you're not gonna hook these up, I recommend taping here so that they can't be moved easily. If you hook up your servos and they're hooked to something that's not energized, then you don't need to worry about that so long as they neutrally go to here. But they're gonna go here if they're not hooked to anything because that's the neutral condition. So you would then have to mechanically adjust by unscrewing the control horn, moving the spline, putting it up to where it pushes those flaps neutral, okay? All right, cool. So lots discussed in this video. We do a lot of education stuff on Brian Phillips RC. We hope that you guys find it helpful and we hope that it's not too combative. Every once in a while, I'll, poke, I'll pick on somebody and we don't wanna be difficult here, but at the end of the day, we're here to make you guys uh, either from a good pilot to a better pilot or from a not pilot to a pilot. And there is a lot that goes into being a pilot. This is not an easy hobby. It is probably one of the harder hobbies you're gonna pick. And once you get good at it, then it's really cool because it's something you can't buy. You have to actually earn this. No matter how much money you've got, you can't just go and pay and be a pilot, just like in the real pilot thing, okay? We're gonna mark the CG next 55 to 65 millimeters from the leading edge. It's on this page. It looks a little something like that. Most quality planes are gonna have that drawing. Sometimes they're marked already for us, so hopefully we don't have to actually mark it. But we already have our battery where we think we're gonna need it. Throttle cuts on and tested, so we know we're safe. To go ahead and flip this upside down, we've already done it a few times, and I've checked it every time, by the way. Okay, there's no marking there. So what we have to do is let's put this down carefully on the couch again, because it's quick. And I'm gonna go 55 to 65, so 55 to 65, this wakes itself up. We go to 55, these are calipers, very simple. You can use a measuring tape if you don't have, and I believe they're talking about from the leading edge of the wing, if you could just spot that for me. Mm -hmm. Yes, they mean the leading edge of the main wing, not that little jut down. Okay. That is a little. Could be confusing. So it's right at the front of the tape. I'll make a bump, and then 65. I would normally do both 55s, but I guess I just wanna see if it's on both sides of the tape. Uh, yeah, it's pretty much both sides of the tape, guys, okay? So I don't know if you guys could pick up on that. There's a little piece of tape that deliminates, that deliminates our center of gravity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's center gravities between here and here. And you're like, well, well but, but there's two marks, Brian. Where is it? Well, that's where you decide. 
There's subjectivity to a degree on how you want the plane to fly. If you want a ton of elevator authority, you want to be a little bit more on the nose heavy, excuse me, a little bit more on the tail heavy side. That means that when you hang the plane from your fingers, I'll show you how to check the CG now. Okay, so you'll flip the plane. When it's set up like this, you'll flip the plane in this configuration. Okay, so on the back holes, it leans forward a little bit, but it basically corrects. And then when you put your fingers on the front hole, it's pretty much level. So I would say right now we're just slightly nose heavy, but that's exactly what you want. So my fingers, the pads of my index middle finger in this case, are balanced in between both of those holes. And look at it, it's just perfect. Now, if you want it nose heavy, it will be actually like falling off your fingers, but there's falling off your fingers, and then there's like barely leaning forward, and then there's nothing. There's a little bit of subjectivity there, I would say, but really what happens is you're with the elevator. You say, how can that little thing move this whole plane? You're just changing the direction it's pointing, okay? That's all you're doing. You're pivoting the plane. The wing is still working, right? Now, when you're in this attitude, the wing is not working the same way, right? So the elevator is just changing the direction still. But this is the most the elevator is ever going to work. It's when you're going down and you're pulling out of a dive and coming back up, right? So same thing with the yaw axis. There's actually a center of mass. We never talk about it on the channel. Center of, so there's all those centers. But we only worry about the center of gravity because it's the most critical for making a plane fly well. And if you're new to flying radio-controlled airplanes, tend toward nose heavy, meaning that it falls forward when you're balancing it. Now, like this, like this plane over here, there's a jet, or that plane there with the retracts down. The retracts would go up and then you would test it upside down. So it just depends on the plane. Sometimes if it's a jet, you mark the top of the wing. Sometimes when it's a high wing, you're gonna mark the bottom of the wings. It just depends on where the center of mass is neutrally like, like this. It's gonna hang down like this all the time. Now this plane will fly upside down. You'll be able to do acrobatics, all that, aerobatics, all that stuff. But you always test the CG so they can balance. All right, so we've talked about all sorts of things here. We've talked about radio setup. We've talked about assembly. We've talked about lots of different theories on flaps and how that works and props and noise and all sorts of different things and landing gear and bogeys. These are bogeys, wing struts. We've covered a lot of topics in here. And so if you guys are overwhelmed, don't be surprised. You're not the only ones that are overwhelmed. When you get new into this hobby and you're really diving in with both feet, you're going to want a lot of you're going to want a lot of information. If you're anything like me, you're going to want to just study it like crazy. Okay, you're at the right place. This is where you can learn more than you could learn at 100 training courses because we have like 2,000 of them probably, or close to it. We probably have about 1,500. Now, of those that are good training videos would probably be, I would say maybe a third or half. So there's a lot of things you can learn by watching these videos. Now, I'm not perfect. I make a lot of mistakes. I say the wrong stuff once in a while. Sometimes I point blank just say it wrong, but then other times I don't do a good job explaining it. So we try our best on this channel to help get you from where you are to where you want to be. And I think in general, we get good feedback from people and they say they've learned a lot. So hopefully you'll be in that camp and not in the camp that's like, you suck and we hate you. Um, you know, just give us a like anyway. It's all right. You don't, we, we're not all perfect here. So hopefully you enjoy this video. And uh, if you like anything about this channel, definitely click the bell for notifications. We're going to be doing these videos far as I can tell for a long time. So keep coming back. We're going to keep you guys pumped up, ready to fly, excited to fly. And when the start, when the sun stops being there and instead it's replaced by a giant storm cloud with a bunch of ice in it called snow, <laughs> we'll still be doing this because we're kind of, <sighs> I don't know. We're, we're kind of diehards. So we'll be doing it in the minus 20 degrees as well. But at the end of the day, we love doing this stuff for you guys. Um, the arrows, uh, Technum 2010, which is 1450 millimeters is right here for your very eyes. Spectrum NX8, obviously we're running this on 2200, 3S by arrows. And so you can buy all the stuff that we showed in this video. Um, and we'll have links to it right in the video description below. You'll be helping to support us financially by small contributions from the manufacturers or distributors, not from you. You pay no extra. We just get small commissions. Uh, from those companies and that's how we make money doing this so that we can keep doing it and believe me it's not without small time commitment so mm -hmm. it's kind of huge but anyway that being said we're really glad you're here with us we do love bringing you this good quality rc content here on brian phillips rc definitely come back leave us comments if you have questions and buy the stuff from the links thanks for watching <laughs>